Welcome everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday night movie gathering. And we've got a great one for tonight. I think this is just a strong um, momentum that's growing here because, um, yeah, we're working towards our online retreat uh, the first full Friday, Saturday, Sunday of August. Uh, and that's going to be beyond the body. So already I feel the spirit is just coming through really strong and is, we're gearing up and so tonight's movie is, you know, it's going to have a lot of quantum in it too. Uh, we had such a humorous movie last week. It was, it was very profound but very, very funny and now we're kind of gearing up to go beyond the body. Not in a sense of um, necessarily traditional means of meditating between 8 and 15 hours a day but actually going into a, a miraculous experience where we really go for pulling the plug on the ego's trick of the, a whole, the whole time and space uh, self-concept and construct that's there. And this is so exciting. I, I already began doing my preparations for next month. <laughs> I was watching a, a 2011 version of me doing the movie Next uh, out at the monastery and um, I was just so lit up last night, Slava knows, I, I could hardly go to sleep because uh, I got so excited. That's back when I actually didn't have a cloth wristband, it was actually, a, I can tell it was dated, it looked like it was at least nine years old because I had a, a metal wristwatch. <laughs> now I've got the iPhone with the the cloth, so I could tell, but it was fantastic. So I've just begun my preparations, but but you're going to get some of the spillover of all the joy that I felt last night. Um, it's going to spill over to this uh, session because um, wow, when I was watching it, I just was really everything was so crystal clear that. Uh, the plan of awakening is really a collapse of the Alpha and the Omega and it's really coming deeper and deeper into the present moment, in the holy instant. So whenever we think of plan, our minds associate time. Uh, when we think of plan, we associate the future plan. When we think of our next steps in Spirit's plan, we're thinking of our steps to come next in time. And actually the plan uh, is more of a collapsing of the Alpha and the Omega. So that's why you might say that Jesus says in the Course that, that the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they collapse time and they also rearrange uh, perception. And at first when you read that, it's like, what does that even mean, rearrange perception? And then when you start to get hints from the Course that uh, you're simply reviewing mentally what has already gone by, that the world is already over, you're simply reviewing it as it seems to still be occurring and so as we believe that we're time-space human beings, it seems like uh, everything we experience is, is, involves linear time. In fact, we can't really relate to anything other than linear time. It would be like um, you know, pulling a fish out of the ocean and, and then uh, talking to the fish while it's in your hand and saying, tell me about the ocean. It's, it's all it knows. Um, everything that it knows is the ocean. Everything it knows is water. And everything that the human being experiences is time and space. But we're going to watch a movie tonight that has so many miracles in it and we will start to explore this idea of, of what is the plan, we will start to open our minds to the idea that the, what the matrix calls the anomaly, the ego is the anomaly of, of the belief that you can separate from God. So everything that the ego has made, including all of time and space, is fiction by nature because it's not eternal and time and eternity cannot coexist. So you might say, if you want the rapid shot to spiritual awakening, the rapid shot to enlightenment, you 
have a prayer to be taken into the holy instant, and then you have a prayer to have God take the final step and to wake up to e eternity. That's really uh, the simplicity of it. And then what seems to be the interactions in time and space, it's, it's like in quantum physics they talk about superposition. I got to watch that one last night with the movie Next, where we seem to have situations and hypothetical opportunities uh, that are presented to us and this whole world is hypothetical. It's the whole world as if the separation occurred. All hypotheticals are uh, projections into the past and projections into the future past. I'd call it the future past because the future is, is the past as well as the past. It's just that the ego has convinced us to believe that the future is different than the past, but that's why psychics like Nostradamus could read centuries into the future because he was simply reading the past. It wasn't, uh, he wasn't like a fortune teller, it was basically he was just reading in the Akashic records. But to human beings, this experience that the world is over uh, is not in awareness. For human beings, every day seems to offer more options, more decisions, and you might say that most human beings are just trying to make the best decisions that they can based on what they believe, based on the limitations of their belief system. They're just trying to do the best that they can. Human beings are, are not aware though that, that they're trying to choose where no choice is possible. They're trying to play the game of the anomaly, which is an impossible game. Jesus calls this world an, an impossible situation. So you know that the I am presence is, is way beyond time and space. It's not even close to time and space. Time and space is the veil that's covering over the I am presence. And this is why tonight we're going to see topics of guidance. We'll see time collapses. We're going to talk about the plan of awakening. But as usual, we have, we had a survey during the week and we had a poll and coming in with a landslide on number one in terms of themes for tonight and tonight's movie was feeling responsible. What is it, 30 some, 30, 37, 40, how many, 40? 37. 37 votes, landslide. So the Holy Spirit had to give us a movie that really deals with feeling responsible. And I guess because it got 37 votes, most of you can relate to that idea of feeling responsible. You probably have some conscious and we'll say some unconscious guilt related to these responsibilities. I see Helena smiling, she's like, <laughs> She's like, yeah, so a lot of it's conscious. <laughs> I don't even know about the unconscious one, but I know I could tell you a lot about, I could write a book about the conscious guilt of feeling responsible. Feeling responsible ends there, I know, with, with uh, people in your home that are, are older, feeling responsible for other people that are living with you, whether they're children or they're adults. Um, feeling responsible for bills, finances, feeling responsible for your house or your apartment or your condo, your, if you have a yard, if you have pets, does anybody ever feel responsible for pets? We got to see ISO on our way in. Yeah, feeling responsible for pets. And it can extend to responsibilities even involving um, your country, uh, responsibilities to vote, uh, responsibilities for uh, doing your civil actions, and maybe some of you even feel a little bit responsible for society. If your society is going through issues like racism or sexism or class differences, sometimes you maybe even take on a few societal responsibilities. Like maybe you feel a little embarrassed, like, oh, come on. 
I saw, a, I think it was on Facebook or Instagram, where a friend of mine named Prem, it was, a, it was a, supposed to be like a political ad, because it had a political sign, and it said, Vote Dog 2020. Uh, and there was a dog there with a political sign, Vote Dog 2020. Humans suck. <laughs> that was what it said on the sign. <laughs> Vote dog, 2020. Humans suck. You know, you really see some good signs on Instagram. You know, you gotta, you gotta love it. You go, just stro scrolling Instagram is like, oh, well, that's an interesting one. I haven't seen that one before. Vote dog, 2020. But see, that would maybe be a responsibility, like maybe you feel embarrassed right now about the human race. Maybe you're like, oh, the humans. Oh my gosh, uh, what do the angels think? <laughs> what are the angels thinking there? Are they scratching their wings? <laughs> going, oh my gosh, what's going on on planet Earth right now? It's pretty wild. Uh, but basically, that being responsible can be associated with so much guilt. And then, our second theme coming in a distant second, how many votes? maybe 14, yeah. something like that, was uh, hiding private thoughts. And don't you love it when we have being responsible, because that's where the guilt seems to be, and then underneath this responsibility feelings, like feeling weighed down with responsibilities, is holding on to private thoughts. You might say, you can call them private thoughts, or call them private beliefs, because the beliefs are under the thought. So it's like it's a stack. You've got a private world that really doesn't exist, but you're just seeing a perceptual hallucination of all your egoic beliefs. That's what you see. When you perceive the time-space world, you're just perceiving a perceptual hallucination based on all your, your ego beliefs. And if there was no belief in the ego, then all would be love, all would be light, and you wouldn't perceive time and space. It would just be heaven, heavenly, absolutely heavenly. Uh, because God created us as pure light, and without an ego belief, then you wouldn't even perceive time and space. So that's part of the hallucination. But, but the fear that's being generated under the surface of this, this hallucination, and then the the feelings, the fear, and then the thoughts, the beliefs, are all coming because in the middle of your mind, you might say, the only reason you can perceive time and space is because you want to perceive it. Jesus says, truth will return to your awareness by your desire, as it was lost by your desire for something else. So we'll just say all of time and space is the desire for something else, other than God. That's, that's all it is. It's just a wish to be something that you're not. It's, it's a wish to be something other than eternal. Time and space is a wish to be something other than spirit. And when we talk about the plan of awakening, the only thing the Holy Spirit wants us to do is to let go of valuing the something else. If truth will be returned to us by our desire, if we, if we desire to live in the present, if we desire the holy instant, if we desire the I am presence, if we desire God, if we put God first, then you might say there'll be a collapsing and a dismantling uh, of everything that we perceive. Can you understand this plan in terms of time? No, absolutely not. Uh, I, I know that that's the tendency. We want to understand what does Jesus mean in the Course when he says time goes backwards and not forwards. And he describes it at one point like a carpet that just rolls up. So imagine if you had a, like a living room carpet and you basically go there, you clear the furniture out and you start rolling the carpet back up. When you get back to the roll, Jesus is saying you're getting close to the holy instant. Time does not go forward, it goes backwards. And yet, that's just a, a, a how it's experienced um, when you start to go much deeper in your mind. You start to realize that you're not making the same 
attempts and this, to fix things and the same mistakes of trying to fix the world because you feel like your mind is closing up like a house of cards where all the cards are collapsing uh, and everything's collapsing and, and you're quite happy with this collapse. Uh, you might remember the movie Eternal Sunshine of the, of the Spotless Mind where it's like a deleting. In that movie all the memories start getting deleted. It's similar to that. It's kind of a collapse of memories in your mind and a, and a deleting so you become more and more still and more and more uh, focused and, and very much closer and closer to the escape hatch of, of just going back into pure love and light. So tonight's movie will involve relationship. Uh, that's the fast track for undoing the ego. Is the Holy Spirit's use of relationship to start to see that you're clueless. The closer you get in perceiving relationships from an absolute Chauncey Gardner being there, clueless state of mind, uh, that's the closer you are to the end of time. Uh, I remember in Joe versus the Volcano, one of the characters is played by Meg Ryan and she's having a, 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 a lunch, I think, uh, or a dinner with um, the Tom Hanks character, with Joe, and he starts sharing something with her and she said, uh, I have absolutely no, what is it, no, I have no response to that. I have absolutely no response to that. You know, in your mind, the more you come closer to complete non-judgment, you'll, you'll start to see that you get closer and closer to a still mind and then as everything starts to collapse, you end up with what Krishnamurti called, I am the world and the world is me. What does that mean? I am the world and the world is me. It means that there's no difference between the observer and the observed. The, the one that's doing the observing is, is also, of this world, is also the, what is observed. So there's no subject and object in, uh, in uh, the real world. There's no subject and object in the happy dream. You simply look upon the world and you just see it's all your mind. That there's absolutely nothing outside of your mind. That the world has not left its source. The world has not left the mind that seemed to think it in the first place. Even though that's the big trick of the ego. As if you have a secret dream and a dream that you project it out and now the dream that you perceive with the five senses seems to be doing something to you as a person and it's a big trick. It's just a big, uh, it's a big hypothetical trick. It's, it's a big hypothetical trick as if the separation has happened. So what we're going to see in this movie is a relationship movie, it's a, it's a love story. Don't you love it when you can wake up with a love story? That's what we like. We like to be able to watch a love story and to wake up. That's what we want. We want to be so taken over by the love story that we're, we're rooting for love. Isn't that what you do with the love story? You're rooting for love. You're wanting the love to emerge. You're wanting, you're wanting the falling into the love experience. You're wanting that vast, heart-opening experience and so when you watch a love story, you're rooting for love. And in this case, we're going to see that there's a lot on the way. Because the love has to be what's real and true, and all of the false responsibility, which is where the guilt is coming in, is just basically from believing in the past and the future. From still believing the past is still active from believing you're living in the past and that it's somehow still activated, it's still happening. That's, that's what the trick of this world is. It's, it doesn't seem to be over and gone, it seems to be still happening. And as long as it still seems to be happening, there seems to be feelings of responsibility with what is still happening. You notice your mind is drawn to, oh, did I remember to turn off the gas when I left the house? Did I, did I remember to feed the cat today? You know, did I remember to make my bed? 
or did I remember to brush my teeth? The more you go on the spiritual journey, the deeper you go, you're going to have a little more spiritual amnesia, where you have chunks of your day, you're, you're going to start to wonder, did I do that? Did I pour myself a drink and did I leave that on the kitchen counter? This has been happening to me for years, where I'm, I get into the room and I'm like looking around, what's missing? My drink. I think I poured it, but I left it on the kitchen counter. I go out there, it's sure enough. You know, you have these little uh, spiritual amnesia moments <laughs> that start happening like, like you're, you can't really hold the linearity together. You don't know how you could have got into the chair without bringing your drink in. You think, how dumb can you be to forget to bring the drink after you just poured it? But this starts to happen. Even your cat, your, your cat has a samadhi experience in your, in your, above your laundry, you know, and then you're like, okay, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of a cat that has the Samadhi experience. Ramana Maharshi, yes. Iso, I don't think cats are supposed to have uh, Samadhi experiences, but these things start to happen in your dream world where you're getting little signs and symbols that, that what you believe about time really isn't so. And it's really simple when you start to realize that you could not have any guilt if you are in the quantum field. You cannot have any guilt if you're in the present moment. The only way you can seem to feel guilt is by believing that something in the past is real and that there's an actual future that's for sure coming. That you're pretty sure the next moment is going to be there. You, you think from all the history you've done, the Groundhog Day thing, you're pretty sure that there's going to be a future. And also you're, you're that just means there's guilt still left in the mind. What does this mean when you seem to die or you lay the body aside? It just means that if you still have guilt in your mind, you will be drawn back into the illusory time-space world. You can call it reincarnation if you want. But if you still have guilt in the mind, you will still draw forth a body you'll still draw forth these situations and scenarios. And the only way that you wake up to heaven is to be absolutely free of the guilt. Because as long as you believe in guilt, and you believe in the mechanisms of guilt, then you will be drawn to the body, and you will be drawn to time and space. It's like you can't, you won't be able to keep it in the mind. It'll just get pushed to the subconscious again, and you have another hallucination of a, of a seeming lifetime in time and space. So that's what we're really doing in this movie tonight, and then next week's movie, and then of course Beyond the Body. We're going to pull out all the stops. We're going to expose the ego's tricks all the way down to the root, down to the core, so you can pull that root up and go, this is ridiculous, I have none of this. I have none of this time-space root anymore. I don't want it. So, tonight's movie is The Adjustment Bureau. We are going to go with Matt Damon and Emily Blunt, who play David and Elise in our movie. And, um, yeah, David is involved in politics. I don't know how David ever could get involved in politics, but this version of David <laughs> is, is involved in politics. Sticky, sticky, sticky. But, if you, it's all designed to bring you back to the present moment in, a, in the most rapid way possible. And then, Elise uh, is a very good dancer, although she's going to have a, an injury. And this is a fascinating um, movie about the, Elise and David being brought together, and then you can tell they've been brought together for a very deep purpose. Uh, they have been drawn together for the plan of awakening. Only in this movie, the plan of awakening seems to involve a, a lot of men with hats on. <laughs> so it may be a little different than your plan of awakening, but in this movie, 
uh, these men with hats, they seem to go through these doors and they, it, it has a real quantum component because they're moving through doors and they're moving through situations in ways that don't seem to be possible for most human beings. So it's got a real time collapse element to it and a real quantum element and in the end they are not only responsible for their perceptions of what they believe they are. In, polit in politics you're responsible for, for uh, being popular, getting elected, and doing things, you know, when you're elected. Um, when you're a dancer you have responsibilities to your dance troupe, you have responsibilities to keep your body in tip-top condition. Those are the surface things that people feel responsible for and there's always guilt of course associated with that when when you're not popular as a politician big time guilt when you when you physically have an injury as a dancer big time guilt and then when you get underneath at the private thoughts you start to realize that it's all about self concepts it's just holding on to roles and concepts of yourself that are quite little uh, when I say little, I mean it's not so vast as forgiveness and not so vast obviously as the Christ idea, which is the reality. But it's just getting caught up into a littleness and then hiding things that would seem to be a threat. And one of the things that gets hidden and pushed out of awareness when the private thoughts are out of awareness is you don't, you don't allow the guidance to come in freely. And so if you are not able to hear the Holy Spirit's guidance, that is a limit on your awakening. That will, that will basically put a big delay maneuver on your spiritual awakening. If you, if you are afraid of the Holy Spirit or if you're blocking the Holy Spirit's guidance, then that's going to be a, a big slowdown in terms of the, the awakening and getting to the present moment. So in this movie, as soon as these two are brought together in their, their busy lives, there's a feeling that they have a very important assignment or mission. And it's tempting to start to see that mission spread out over time, but remember, I'm giving you the clue to true understanding is basically when we are brought together for the Holy Spirit's purpose, it's always just for collapsing time. It's always just for coming into the present moment. It's never about making the world a better place. It's never about achievements and accomplishments in the world. You know, if you, if you think that if you get certain accolades and, and, um, and people are praising you in the terms of spirituality and everything, you don't get any brownie points for anything in time and space because it's a projection of the ego. That's why when you, when you make it back to the pearly gates, the, they don't have Angel Peter or Gabriel saying, okay, what are your accomplishments? Did you, were you a good Course in Miracles facilitator? Uh, how many years did you facilitate, you know? Did people do well after, after your uh, Course in Miracles group or you know, what, where, how did your students do, you know. There's not any kind of, of standard or gradation of what you seem to do or accomplish in time and space because it's a projection. The only thing that matters is your state of mind. The only thing that matters is your experience and if you free your mind from the ego then you rapidly approach the light because you don't have anything blocking you from the light. The light's always been there. But there's nothing in terms of form. In this movie there seems to be the, the, the plan seems to involve um, David getting elected. And, um, and, and even the higher the position he gets elected to the better. This is not how the plan works. So if some of you are watching the movie and you're, you're going, oh, that's a strange plan, uh, that it pivots on politics. Yeah, you're right. It does, the plan of awakening does not pivot on politics. But in this movie, 
Uh, that's what makes the discernment even more important because if you have people that you're working with and people around you that are telling you to be a good something in the world, it's missing the point of clearing your mind of all the false ego debris and coming into an experience of stillness and deep silence, which, which is what the plan of awakening is about. So I think you're going to enjoy this. I always do. I always I saw this movie at a theater in, in uh, Salt Lake City when I saw it the first time and I had all kinds of nice swirls of joy going in my heart while I was watching this movie. But I will join you for some choice points um, to, to remind you of what I've just told you about so you don't get lost in, in the adjustments of the world because to the, to the ego, adjusting to this world is very important. And the ego wants you to make the right moves so that you can advance as a person in this dream world. And that's not what spiritual awakening is about. It's not about developing a better self-concept or becoming a better person. Isn't it amazing to have a spirituality that's not designed to make you a better person? I kind of, I, th I find that delightful. If you want, if you, if you say, I, that's too much, then I think you can go to the self-help section of Barnes and Nobles and there's plenty of books, but you can excuse yourself from the movie. If, if you want, if you want self-help and self-improvement, no, this is not the movie for that. But, if you're interested in spiritual awakening and peace of mind and joy and happiness, then this is going to be your movie. This will be a movie. But this is not about self-improvement. You, you are created perfect by God. How can you improve upon a perfect creation? You can only unwind and peel the onion of false conditioning and false egoic belief that is covered over the perfect self, but, but there's no way to really improve upon the Christ, because the Christ was, is, and forever shall be absolutely perfect. And Christ actually needs no self-help. <laughs> Christ is, is uh, quite content at being uh, the Lord of life and not needing to have any self-improvement classes. So, enjoy the movie and I will be back soon to uh, pop in and, and join you in this movie. And it's a, it's a good one. We're going to have a good romp tonight. So there it is. We're already taken down number two in the poll. Hiding private thoughts. Because when you have an image, um, the first thing you need to really do is look in the mirror and give a speech to yourself like David Norris is giving there. Because he's just coming clean. He's basically He's been playing the game of politician and he just decided, no, this, this is not really uh, what's the truth. That's just part of a game and an image that he's been playing as far as part of his self-concept and now he's exposing the whole thing of the research that goes into the tie and the scuffing of the shoe and paying consultants and, and adapting and adjusting. So here we are, the movie's called The Adjustment Bureau and he's using his defeat speech as almost like in a 12-step 12, group where you give your lead. He's giving his lead uh, for healing. And I know some of you have been through 12-step groups so you know what I'm talking about with these leads where you just speak from the heart and you say, here's the way it is. This is what's going on. And he basically is taking a huge step here immediately towards healing, towards the present moment, towards integration, towards say what you mean and mean what you say, towards having your, your desires and your beliefs and your thoughts and your emotions and your perceptions completely lined up. And what is that but a miracle? If you can have everything in your mind completely aligned, in complete alignment, that is a miracle. And Jesus says at one point in the Course, you, you may believe it would take a miracle for what I'm 
I'm asking of you. And he says, and it's true. It, it will. <laughs> he's, he's telling you in his Course in Miracles, it will take a miracle for you to be happy. It will take a, a miracle for you to heal. It will take a miracle for you to come back and be true to yourself. And right away, this David Norris is doing it. He, he loses the election. He meets Elise in the, in the restroom, in the men's restroom. The last place you think you meet your soulmate is in the men's restroom if you're a man. But there it is. You know, she comes out and she does the no private thought thing. When she comes out, she's totally spilling her guts. And then he has to laugh because she seems to read him completely. And if you're a politician, you don't like to be read like that. But she even says at the end, when he says, oh, I think I'm going to enjoy some quiet time by myself, she said, I don't buy it. I think you love it. And maybe just her saying that forced him to take a look at how much he did love the game of politics, but it didn't take him long to spill the beans in front of everybody. Instead of having the big speech about, I'll get back up and I will be back, he cut it off short right there and he said, no, uh, that's, not, that's not the truth. Uh, he is taking his first big stride at loosening from the self-concept. So to me, that's, that's worth highlighting because if you could just take a look in the mirror and give yourself that talk where you, where you say, well, I've been doing a lot of this and this and this and that, but it's all because I'm trying to put up a front, um, play a part, play a role, um, trying to pretend to be something that I'm not. And when you can look in the mirror and lay it out with yourself, then you have just taken the most sincere step towards spiritual awakening. Because you only can seem to fool yourself when you hold on to these ego images and ego self-concepts. When you look in the mirror and you say, you know, it stops right here. I'm just not going to play the game anymore. I'm going to actually be authentic. And if something doesn't draw me, if something doesn't inspire me, if something doesn't really lift me up, I'm not going to compromise and just pretend and scuffle along pretending that I'm okay with something that I'm not okay with. You finally start to realize, I can let go of thoughts and beliefs and emotions that don't serve my happiness, that don't serve my peace of mind. So, he's just taken the big step right there. He, he just met Elise. He doesn't even have a contact number. He, he doesn't, I don't think he's even got her name, right? He didn't even get her name. No phone number, nothing, as she scurries off avoiding security. And yet, that one meeting with her has turned him into an authentic movement of healing right there in front of the crowd that he's supposed to uh, pretend and hold up the mask for. He has, he's dropped the mask already at this early stage. Three years later. Well, let's make some adjustments and corrections to the presentation here. He was told in the room that, um, that they make adjustments, they, they intercede where they need to, um, his angel right there was just saying, we, we try to keep you on plan. Except the belief to try to keep you on plan assumes that you can go off plan. And I'm here to tell you, you are never off plan. All things work together for good. In fact, the, the man with the white hair told him in the room, um, they make changes and adjustments. And uh, he said, sometimes things just happen. Uh, and they're at random. No, not true. Nothing happens at random. Everything that you perceive down to the tiniest nuance is part of a prearranged script that took one instant to complete, even though 
it seems to, from a time perspective, play out over millions of years. But as soon as the belief in separation arose, the plan of the Holy Spirit was handled in one instant. So it basically, in that time of terror where the ego seemed to arise and be taken seriously, the Holy Spirit was given as an instantaneous correction. So at the same time the problem arose, the correction arose. So it was handled instantaneously. And that's why time is actually simultaneous, it's, it's not linear. Uh, the Holy Spirit answered the entire belief in separation in one instant, instantaneously when the problem seemed to arise. So basically what that means is time is simultaneous. Some of you have read Seth material or all kinds of metaphysical material and some of the metaphysical materials talk about parallel lives. It's kind of like, you, we could say all of the so-called lifetimes in form between birth and death are all going on simultaneously and then the mind just chooses to focus with a sense of amnesia forgetting the big picture, forgetting the whole, forgetting the simultaneity, it focuses in on a sliver of perception that is called a, a lifetime in this world. And Jesus actually, one time Helen, he kind of took Helen and they went flying together, kind of like uh, Margot Kitty and Christopher Reeve in Superman. Uh, one time Helen Shuckman went flying along with Jesus and they went sailing along and what was below them were all these seeming lifetimes and they almost flew by and missed the entire lifetime of Helen Shuckman. But they did see it and Jesus said, there's your lifetime. They almost missed it. It was so tiny, it was so microscopic in the larger scheme of things that what seems to a human being as a very long time, as a lifetime, is, is it, the tiniest little blink in in the in this simultaneous time because because everything is going on simultaneously so you might just say that the the simultaneous answer of the holy spirit to the unholy instant is like in quantum physics they call it the quantum field where everything is completely connected there is no delineation between what seems to be a lifetime and another lifetime, or a parallel lifetime, because they're all happening simultaneous, so parallel doesn't really cut the mustard. Parallel, it looks like two, or multiple, looks like multiple, but the quantum field is just pure energy. Everything is simultaneous. And that's why when you make it back to the quantum field, you make it back to the observer and the observed are one. The subject and object are one. There is no world apart from your mind. Or, as Krishnamurti said, I am the world and the world is me. He was literally speaking of a state of mind where everything is absolutely connected and there's no way to differentiate anything. It's all just, you might just say it's connected energy. It's just like a very high frequency. And so, Waking up to the real world of the happy dream is just your mind opening up to this frequency of absolute connection. What does that mean in Course in Miracles terms? There's no judgment. There's nothing to judge between. It's like one big happy soup of energy and there's nothing distinct enough to judge against something else in that soup of, of energy. Uh, and, and this is what the quantum field is. Einstein, who developed the theory of relativity, um, when he started to look at certain quantum experiences that started to reveal the quantum field, that was frightening to Einstein. The quantum field was very frightening to Einstein. He actually got a name for it, spooky action at a distance. It was spooky to Einstein because pure connectedness to a scientist, oh, that's just like terror a scientist to be aware of pure connection. So he called it spooky action at a distance because he was aware that molecules, atoms, in way across the universe, if you, if you test 
do something to one, it can affect something that seems to be on the other side of the cosmos, or the other side of the galaxy, or the other side of the solar system, and that is spooky action at a distance. He had no explanation for that. And really, there is no explanation for it, except that it's the forgiven world or the happy dream. So, he's just been told um, that there's corrections that are made and authorized by the chairman, and that these guys with these hats, they have to intervene to make corrections in the plan. And he's told humans are not aware of these corrections that are made. So the main thing I'm trying to say is that there's not some things that are at random and some things that are happening with this plan with these guys and this chairman, that there is nothing that happens. Everything that seems to happen, Jesus says, everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. It's just one mind and everything you perceive in time and space is ex happening seeming to happen exactly the way that you want it to, based on your beliefs. So, if you judge anything about time and space, it's really just a judgment in the mind that's preventing you from the quantum field or the happy dream. It doesn't matter. If you judge anything at all about time and space, that is an erroneous judgment in a, in a field, in a pool of energy that doesn't even know what judgment is. So, that's what the forgiven world or the happy dream is in the Course in Miracles. It's just there's no judgments whatsoever. And there's nothing happening by chance. There is no such thing as chance. There is no such thing as chance. And there is no such thing as, as being off plan. You know, sometimes if you hear spiritual teachers say, well, if you were doing good there, but then you got off the plan. No, the plan is meant to collapse time and space, and the collapsing is, is, Jesus has already collapsed everything. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You can't ever really go off plan. You can say, well wait a minute, he's teaching us about a right mind and a wrong mind, and that's a metaphor in the Course in Miracles too, to distinguish between the ego and the Holy Spirit, but to tune into the Holy Spirit in your mind, to tune into the guidance of the Holy Spirit, takes you faster to that forgiven world, faster to that happy dream. In a, I just say faster, I'll say in a more direct way. It collapses time and space, collapses the Alpha and Omega, and takes you back into the holy instant. But it, it's never, there's never a point where the angels are sitting around you going, oh, yeah, you should have spilled the coffee there, and you should have met this one, and you shouldn't have met this one. There's no coulda, woulda, shouldas with the angels. The angels aren't like telling you that you messed up in form. Because what does that even mean to mess up in form? It's just, if you listen to the ego, you delay the awakening in your mind. <laughs> And if you listen to the Holy Spirit, you accelerate the awakening. And ultimately, you know, for some of you who, who have been into the, I think it's Lesson 158, you know that the mind has already designated the time uh, of waking up. It's already set by the mind when the mind will accept the atonement. You know, even that, even accepting the atonement, and waking up from the dream, having God take the final step, even that acceptance, if you read Lesson 158, Jesus tells you right there in 158 that it's already determined by the mind, not your human split mind, not the personality self is not determined when, but in the mind, the mind, the one mind, that is already uh, been determined. So, my grandfather used to tell me, you know, I would talk with him, we'd talk all these things about, he would talk about hypotheticals, not in using the term hypotheticals, but I would get all upset about some outcome, some call that a referee made against the team I was rooting for on the TV, 
and I would start screaming, a terrible call, my team would have won if the ref hadn't blown the call and everything, and he would raise his finger and he would go, if, David, if, largest word in the, the English language. I didn't realize what he was trying to teach me back then, but he was raising his finger and he was talking about if, if only, those were my things I said all the time. If only I had done this, if only the referee had missed the call, if only my team, the person had caught the ball, my team would have won. I was always giving my grandfather, Heinrich Hermann Hofmeister, I was always giving him the if only, if only, if only. And he would always just laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and raise his finger and say, if. He was always pointing to me, long before the course, he was pointing out my hypothetical thinking. Like, he would laugh as if, as if there's nothing I could really do to change the script. And he was giving me the foreshadowing that the script is written, and you can just change your mind or perspective, but you can't really change the script. But the script, believing you can change the script is where all problems come in. The ego's plan of salvation is very simple. If something in the world would change, I would be happy. <laughs> That's the ego's plan of salvation. If something in the world would change, I would be happy. And then the Holy Spirit's plan, which is much different, is if I change my mind about my perception of the world, I would be happy. You see the difference between if something in the world would change, I would be happy, and if I change my mind, my my perception, I would be happy. That's, that's the serenity prayer right there for some of you 12-steppers. You know, what you can change, what you cannot change, and I'm telling you right now the wisdom to tell the difference. I'm telling you the difference between what you can change and what you can't change. So really, the Course in Miracles is just an expanded version of the serenity prayer that's in the 12-step program. Now, in terms of this movie, these characters with these hats, they're they're pretending as if they're telling the, the God's truth, we'll say, or the Holy Spirit's plan, and they aren't. And this is why it's easy to get lost, though, with spiritual teachers and different teachings and different philosophies, because if you had some people that uh, started, that did what he saw them do, and then said, I know everything is going on in your mind, I can read your thoughts. The angel said, we can't really read your thoughts. He just set it up with a question and then, you know, they can make kind of educated guesses, but they can't read thoughts. And not only that, they, they, they don't intervene sometimes in a plan and then other times it's just random. That's not the way the whole the world works. And they're not omniscient, um, but He's perceiving them as some kind of be behind the scene uh, thing. This happens when people go to ashrams and gurus and, and whatever, and the guru starts to, they take whatever the guru says as to be the absolute truth. And they follow whatever the guru or the teacher says out of their love and trust, and then sometimes they find out actually it's not, uh, wasn't the most helpful guidance. Uh, and this is. This is what I'm doing with this movie. You know, he's, he's, how can you tell that these angels, call them angels or whatever with hats, are, are completely, are not legitimate because why? They threaten him. You think the angels could get away with threatening you and, and be under Jesus? Jesus is not sending out threatening angels. Don't tell anybody. That's a private thought right there. Uh, if, the, if these angels work for Jesus, they'd all be fired on the spot with their hats too. Go home. Don't be threatening uh, one, of our, one of your beloved creatures who is really yourself. Don't, don't threaten another. So right away with these angels, they're threatening. Uh, don't tell anybody or they're going to basically erase his brain. Uh, and he says, yeah, give me a, a, a lobotomize me. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. So there's some things when people watch this movie, they're like, it's a little bit suspicious <laughs> that these angels 
are threatening to delete uh, memories. And then your family will think you went crazy, and you won't think anything. Oh great, that's very comforting. Uh, yeah, that's just what an angel would say. I would have some fun with these angels. I would say, yeah, well, let me talk to you about a little bit about the way it works. Because the system doesn't really work that way. But the important thing is, that even the angels that he perceives are part of his perception because whatever we perceive is what we believe in. So if we believe in authority figures, we'll say the angels are like authority figures, then he's, now he's torn. Why? It's because he's drawn to Elise and clearly this group of angels are, are blocking him from meeting with Elise, and he wants to meet with Elise. And they're basically saying, no, forget about her, and even, even his uh, angel that just spoke to him on the boat is saying, just forget about her, you know, you're not, they've put so much energy and resources to, to you not finding her, she, you know, it must be important in some way. They, they're all talking about this chain of command and this chairman, but this whole system is a little bit skewed. But in the end, we have to remember that everything that happens to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. And also we cannot forget the something that Ramana Maharshi taught, and also Jesus teaches the same thing that Ramana taught in the workbook of A Course in Miracles. What happens is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not desire. It, it, what, what happens is what I desire, what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. I'll say it one more time. What happens, even in the dream world, is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. That just shows you how powerful the mind is, and that everything is based on desire. So nothing is at random, Nothing is out of place, and the reason that forgiveness is just unified state of awareness where everything is simultaneous is, is because that's the Holy Spirit's answer to the belief in separation. It's a simultaneous correction. Time is simultaneous, it is not linear. And yet the ego made linear time as a way to perpetuate guilt. Because if you believe in linear time, you believe in the body, you believe in real actions, real situations, and real events, and that's where this sense of, of, of feeling like you, you are afraid of this responsibility thing, you, you, are, you have a fear of responsibility. Why? Because the ego has set up future false responsibilities and past false responsibilities that block the simultaneous experience of the forgiven world or the, the holy instant of this, this quantum field that is always available. It's, it's that simple. If you, if you give your mind over back to the Holy Spirit, the quantum field, whatever you believe you're doing or not doing in form is not really what, what this is about. Because the ego made up the body, the ego made up time and space, and the ego is just spread out time and space in a linear kind of storyline, and every time you feel a heavy sense of responsibility with something, it's because of the belief in linear time. It's not coming from the holy instant. It's not coming from the simultaneous experience of simultaneous time. It's coming from this make-believe, fictitious, past or future that the mind is preoccupied. Now in this movie, you know, you can see uh, David is not happy. I mean, it was a very frightening experience with these angels. Yeah. Next time you have a frightening experience with angels, maybe you should question whether they're angels or not. <laughs> angels or demons? <laughs> Wasn't that a book? <laughs> yeah, Dan Brown. No, Angels are symbols of the Holy Spirit. Angels are always symbols that the Holy Spirit used. So angels never command, angels never demand, and believe me, angels never threaten. If you meet a threatening angel, you need to 
get out your uh, Holy Spirit chant or something. Uh, call on the name of Jesus or something if you have threatening angels. Because these are not symbols of the Holy Spirit. They are gentle, they are kind, they are loving, they are inspiring. Whether they have wings or not, they sh you should feel inspired after you have a contact with an angel. Not afraid. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So, he's actually still feeling, he's a bit, um, bit shaken up by the whole thing. But actually, I feel like he's been very authentic. And, and so she has she, and there's something there where their connection is important in the forgiveness. As we know, Jesus always can use relationships to peel the onion of consciousness or to peel away all the, the pride, all the preferences, all the judgments. And, and that relationships are a very good tool for doing that. And that's what this movie is really about. Right now, we're not seeing much of Elise but she is not far behind here because that's part of the authentic awakening is the, the, the release that goes on in healing relationships. Okay, here we go. It's, they're trying to tell him, now the angels are trying to tell him it doesn't matter what you feel. Oh, no, no, no. No, Jesus says in the Course, the one the one right use of judgment is how do you feel. He says the one right use of judgment is how you feel. Your feelings are admittedly need to, to go through, a, a, the mind has to go through a lot of purification, but your feelings are still the touchstone of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the feelings, how do you feel in the most basic direct way is your intuition is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. So that's the first contradiction right there. And second of all, remember what I said, some of you were on the guidance uh, retreat I did recently, where I said guidance is not for something in the world to, to make or build or, or achieve or accomplish or accumulate something in the world. Guidance is never, ever, ever, ever for that purpose. It's only to bring you back to the present moment. It's only to bring you back to this deep sense of connection, of intimacy, of love, of joy, of happiness. And that's only available in the moment. Any ego teachings that are trying to tell you, you'll, you were not happy in the past, but uh, maybe you'll find it in the future, this is not the teachings of Jesus. In fact, Jesus has a section in the text called the immediacy of salvation, where Jesus says, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. He's saying, don't buy this sneaky, sneaky ego trick about future happiness. If you, are, if you are thinking you're going to be happy in the future, that's another subtle deflection away from the holy instant. That's another subtle hypothetical projection to try to make you believe that sometime in the future, if you pursue a future goal, that when you attain this so-called future goal, you'll be happy. That's the trick of the ego. So all self-concept goals of becoming a better person, becoming better at whatever seems to be happening in time and space, to become, even to become a better Course in Miracles student in the future, or a better Course in Miracles teacher in the future. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. This ego is doing whatever it can to, to come up with its own future goals to keep you from forgiving and being content in the present moment. Because now, as Jesus says, as all the great teachers and saints and avatars and mystics, as Eckhart Tolle, uh, Byron Katie, myself, all, all of us are saying the same thing. 
You have to be present to be happy. You have to be present to be peaceful. You have to be present to know who you are. That the present moment, Jesus says in the Course, is the closest approximation of eternity. The present moment is the closest approximation of eternity. He says at one point in the Course, the past is gone, the future but imagined. These concerns, past and future, are but defenses against present change of focus. And that's where the miracle comes in. The miracle is present change of focus. It's focusing on a, above the battleground. It's focusing from, from higher above. Did anybody ever see that movie, uh, quantum physics movie, uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? Did you see that? Okay, good, good. I, I love it. Did, did you see did you see the sequel to What the Bleep? Yeah, that one's called Down the Rabbit Hole. A phrase, I, there we go, I use that a few times every week. <laughs> uh, down the Rabbit Hole, but that's got Dr. Quantum. It's got an animated Dr. Quantum in Down the Rabbit Hole. And in that, he is working with his subject and he says, um, He's working with the Flatland and the, the, the woman's uh, in Flatland. What do you think Flatland is except linear time? You know, they keep saying to defeat the coronavirus, you got to flatten the curve. Listen, the virus is already part of Flatland. The, the, it's already part of linear time. Diseases, viruses, catching viruses, that's all linear time, that's all ego, that's already flatland. But in Down the Rabbit Hole, he comes to her and he comes to her from another dimension of that's beyond two-dimensional flatland, like Pac-Man land, and he takes her up into three-dimensionality. And she is like, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, she, can, she can't even believe what three dimensions feel like, because they're using the metaphor in what down the rabbit hole of if everybody's accustomed to thinking reality is is flat, is linear, is two dimensional, that if you were lifted up to a dimension beyond, of course it would be scary if all you're accustomed to and familiar with. And that's why even the spiritual journey seems a little bit there's feelings of fear that come up, there's feelings of uneasiness, because when you have miracles, you're literally going into verticality. You're literally coming back. If you look at the, the cross, like with Jesus, you know, don't think of the cross in terms of sacrifice, because that's a flatland idea. But think of the cross as where the vertical comes across the horizontal. The vertical is the miracle. So the miracle is the perfect alignment in your mind to collapse the, the cross, the, the alpha and the omega. The horizontal beam is collapsed every time you experience the miracle until in the end the entire cross is eclipsed uh, through the atonement when you go completely vertical. And that's what's going on in this movie. You know, he, he feels a connection with Elise. They have a great rapport, there's, there's, a, there's a strong feeling, and that's exactly how Jesus uses relationships. He knows, that he puts a spark there in a relationship, and he basically says, whenever you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. He, he's always teaching us to remember the holiness, remember the, the love that's, that's there in every single meeting. Even, he even says, even if you think of them, if you meet anybody, if you, if you see anybody, if you think of anybody, you know, you have an opportunity for salvation. You have an opportunity to see that your brother is literally you. Not, you're not your brother's keeper, you're not your sister's keeper. Your brother, your sister, if you let go of all personal interest, if you let go of all past preferences, if you let go of all past learning, any time you meet anyone, you literally can, can experience salvation in that moment, just by seeing them 
with the Holy Spirit for the first time. Because all the differences that seem to be there, everything of time and space, including the body and all of the overlays, none of those are real. And when you meet somebody without a filter from the past, you meet them for the very first time, meaning you meet them in, we'll say, in the quantum field or in the, the happy dream. And as soon as you do that with one person, you, it transfers to everyone. So it's not like a cumulative thing. You have to, you do this with one and then you've got to do it with the seven billion. No, it transfers immediately to the seven billion as soon as you do it with one. Because it's, just, it's in the mind. The, the filter is in the mind, the filter isn't in the body. You don't have to, to repeat this over and over with seven billion until you get it right. Or, or reincarnation, the trillions of, of encounters, trillions and trillions over many, many years. No, that's not how it works. You just have to, to see one brother or sister completely without judgment, and then that's it. You're back in the quantum field that you never left. You're back in the happy dream. You're, you're back in the forgiven world. So, if you notice here, he's finally met Elise after three years, immediately these ha, ha angels are trying to intervene to keep him from uh, meeting her. And the only reason anyone would try to block you from this holy encounter, from this deep holy relationship, is, is the ego would love to substitute self-concept goals. Something in the world, some kind of self-concept that the mind will believe in to take the place of what's really going on. And that's why we, it is a letting go of the, the concepts of this world. Jesus talks about that in the, in the text, you know, where he, he's, he's basically saying, I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, how to look upon myself or, or anything in this world. And when you really go into that, I do not know the thing I am, that's like a version of lesson number one. I, nothing I see means anything. I do not know the thing I am. It's like making a space in your mind of complete stillness where you surrender the idea that you think you know who you are in time and space, and through this blank space you give Jesus and the Holy Spirit the opportunity to tell you who you are. Because once you let go of believing you're something in time and space, then who you are, who we are, will tell us of itself. Immediately it will be known, our identity is known. As soon as we let go of the belief and the pursuit of something in time and space. That's why Buddha said, empty your mind. That's why Lao Tzu said, empty your mind. That's why Jesus said, empty your mind. That's why I'm saying, empty your mind. It's not that there's nothing there. It's not like you'll go there and you'll go, oh great, I followed David's instruction and now I'm just absolute emptiness. That doesn't even sound good. Absolute emptiness, you know. I mean, in Buddhism they try to make it, build it up like it's a great thing, but I don't know about you, but absolute emptiness is not exactly the most appealing thing. If I'm going to meditate, it's not necessarily to go into absolute emptiness. But it's part of making a space for the Holy Spirit to tell you who you are. There's something beyond the emptiness. You know, Jesus is not trying to lure us back to the Kingdom of Heaven through emptiness. He's saying, yeah, that, that, that is part of it. It's the first part of the equation, emptying your mind. But then the Holy Spirit will tell you who you are, because the Holy Spirit is the remembrance of who you are. That's, that's a function of the Holy Spirit, is to be the remembrance of, of the Christ. The, the reminder that will never go away, the spark that can never go out, the flame that can never go out, that memory that can never be extinguished is, is what the Holy Spirit is. So, here we go. Now we see that there's been all these interference patterns, but, but if you really want to wake up, even false angels, men with hats, can't stop you if you really want to wake up. Even these pseudo-angels will be nothing. You can, you can blow on them and they will go away, if 
you have a desire to wake up and your mind is so powerful that you are the Christ mind, admittedly seemingly sleeping, but still the Christ mind, that mind is extremely powerful and whatever you desire must come to you, including enlightenment. There's nothing in the world that can stop eternal love from remembering itself. Okay, I know you're getting fascinated with these dark angels and their plan, so I'm going to have to do a little more exposing here. That when, whenever there's a belief in multiple plans, you know, everything's working together for good. There aren't multiple plans, but whenever there's a belief that something can, could have gone wrong in form, these are hypothetical distractions from the ego. You probably know them as the coulda, woulda, shoulda's. Have any of you ever played the coulda, woulda, shoulda game in your mind? If only this is different, if only I hadn't said that, if only I hadn't done that, if only I stayed dating this one and married this one instead of that one. You know, coulda, woulda, shoulda's are all hypotheticals and that's what these angels, dark uh, angels are representing here. They're, that big building that they were in and all those men in the meeting and everything and, and getting out this big book and saying, oh, they were meant to be together in these other decades, but they're not meant to be together now and they need to be torn apart. All these alternate influences and forces are based on one thing and that's hypotheticals. Uh, nothing has ever been out of place. Uh, when you forgive, you're going to be so amazed that every single thing that ever seemed to happen to you was always in perfect divine order, but you just weren't in the perspective to see it. You were still seeing it through the ego lens. And of course, that's why all the coulda, woulda, shouldas were in there, because the ego is always saying that something could be different in form. Something needs to change in form. Something could be better off in form. Oh, I would be happy if I had this job, this house, this partner, this pet, you know, this whatever, fill in the blank. The ego always is trying to trick the mind into thinking that something in form will make the difference and you'll be happy. Because that's what its game of time is all about. It just is always pointing to time. Something in the future has to change and then you'll be happy. And all these hypotheticals are all coming from the same defense against the holy instant. So in this case, even when they're saying, you know, they're still drawn to each other because they've met in the past and now they shouldn't be together and now they have to be broken apart. This is not how the Holy Spirit operates at all. The Spirit is trying to bring you together to go through a mirroring process where you start to see things that you believe that aren't true and then you let them go. And then you get drawn closer and closer into a deeper sense of love, a deeper sense of intimacy until you finally realize you're the same one. That's, that's pretty intimate. That's, that's even more intimate than the world teaches, you know. But it's kind of in, if you listen to the marriage vows, where two become as one, yeah, that's, that's the direction it's heading. That's, that's what the goal of, of even marriage is about, is, is coming to a, a sense of love and a sense of deep union and intimacy. That's what marriage is, union, aside from all the ego concepts, which are just time hypothetical self-concepts, you know, which is, it's got its own version of marriage, believe me. <laughs> It will, it will try to use that one too to keep you away from the Holy Instant as well as anything else. But the Holy Spirit really knows there is such a thing as true union, and that's union of the mind. That's why Jesus says, minds are joined, bodies do not. He's trying to draw the mind back into that sense of recognition of, of itself, where you just recognize yourself as who you are and who you've always been. So in this movie, it's, it's really fascinating to see the, the ego's attempts to keep them from joining. It doesn't want them to even meet. 
it, it goes through all this effort to keep them from even meeting. And then finally he does meet through communication. He goes into the diner and said, does anybody here know where this dance studio is? And somebody does. And the angels are like, ah. Oh. Then they try to crash a taxi, have police officers delaying him, uh, do anything that they can, shut down phone lines. You could see the ego is very much about blocking communication. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is very much about making true contact, deep, meaningful, true contact through communication. In fact, that's how they met in the first place, in the restroom. The men's restroom was they had true communication. She came out of her stall in the men's restroom and, and laid it all out. And then he laid it all out. And then they had immediate connection just through their direct, open, true communication. That started the spark. And now it's even continued because they had, were able to, to sit down. They never were able to have their meal, because that was interrupted too. But every little bit of communication that they have is moving them towards, towards the atonement. And, and, and you'll notice in your relationships, that if you have relationships where, where you feel like there's a break in communication, really it's the ego it has just been believed in, because really communication is unbroken. And it's not just limited to words and actions. It's, it's mental, it's telepathic. And the ego still tries to break off relationships whenever the communication gets too deep and too close to the holy instant. The ego will try to break off communication and substitute another self-concept goal in place of where this is heading. So the ego is always trying to do what they're doing. Bring in agendas to form. Bring in future goals. Bring in self-concept things. You see it happen in relationships where two people get married, then let's say one becomes a workaholic. They're afraid of the intimacy, they're afraid of the depth, and then they work huge amounts of hours, puts a great strain on the relationship, puts a great strain on the, the communication, and then the ego breaks, breaks off the relationship. Or somebody, one feels bored and the other one uh, is, is maybe distracted, and then there's, somebody has an affair, they break the fidelity, they break the trust, and then comes the broken communication, and then the breakup comes. And then Start again. You see how the ego doesn't care how many times you play this over. It just doesn't want you to have true communication. It will always try to substitute something else or someone else or some kind of future goal to keep the mind from becoming truly intimate and opening to the present moment. So now we're on to it. You know, we're, we're seeing it so clear through this movie that that's why true, deep, open, intimate communication of holding back, not, not holding back private thoughts, not trying to disguise something, not trying to cover over something, not trying to distract away from something or hide away from something. When you really start to see what the ego is about, then you're, you're really sparked. You really feel that deep desire for a deepening communication. And that's what's so great about this movie is, the more that the resistance rises, the more that David is basically saying, as he's running across the street, you know, you're not going to stop me. I'm determined to uh, find her. You know, he basically is telling, telling off the angels. <laughs> you're not going to stop me. Uh, I'm going to find her. And really, that's him saying underneath, you're not going to stop me from finding God. Your, your games of time and space, your games of future goals and past regrets, your games of future worries and past guilt are not going to stop me from, from finding God and knowing who I am. That's, that's basically what he's saying uh, when he's determined to hang in there. So here we go. Now it's going to get interesting. <laughs> Has his desire to connect grows stronger and stronger. 
So that was the angel they call the hammer. And, and the hammer must represent an unconscious belief in uh, sabotage. Because um, that's what the ego is. It's, it's a belief that you're something that you're not, and so every time the ego rears up in your mind, as you begin to ap approach, approach the holy instant and, and this deeper communication, it comes up as uh, sacrifice, it comes up as self-sabotage. And what Jesus tells us in the Course, that, that a, a particularly strong um, form of this belief in sacrifice or sabotage is sickness. Um, because the mind is so identified with the body, and because now the mind has forgotten heaven, and it's identified with the body identity, then sickness is, is like a forerunner to death. You know, sickness is like a, a little snapshot of, don't forget how frail, and weak and vulnerable that you are. And that's why it shakes things up. Just like right now the pandemic is, is kind of shaking everything up in time and space because of that strong identification with the body. You know, if there wasn't such a strong identification with the body, they wouldn't have had lockdowns, quarantines, they wouldn't have shut down cities, nations, economies, it just shows you how vulnerable the sleeping mind is to the belief in sickness. It's just, the, what seems to be going on with the pandemic is just showing that there's a picture of a world that, that is very frightening to the sleeping mind because of its, its, uh, its belief in, in the ego. So the ego is just using sickness or symptoms um, on the body is kind of like a, a strong shock to the mind. Just when the mind thinks it's, it's handling this world in a decent way, then it pulls the ace card out, which is sickness, in order to bring a sense of vulnerability to the mind. And that's just another one of these kind of, that's like a card that the ego pulls out. Whenever things start to get a little too intimate, and you start to get a little too close to true communication, then bingo, the ego will play the sickness card. Because that is, is vulnerability. That's the belief that you can't communicate. That's the belief that you're alone, that you're separate. That you will, that you've left God, and that there's no hope for you. There's no way to get back, and and so that's in this movie that when they say they're bringing in a, an angel from a higher floor on a higher pay grade, basically in this system, uh, this is the one they call the hammer. Uh, we also saw him though. Was what was the one we just saw? The yes man. Uh, he's in that one, and, and there's another one. I just saw recently where he was on there too. I can't remember which one that was, but this same guy, uh, actor, is coming in there. But, but I'm just kind of setting that up because that's, that's a very common uh, tactic of the ego to keep the mind from, from going into to intimacy, this, uh, this card of uh, sickness. Okay, there you have it. Clearly laid out. He says it's about who I am and his choices. And that's exactly it. The ego made up the world. The ego made up choice. There's no choices in heaven, but, but the, the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made. So the Holy Spirit uses the concept of choice. And you may remember there's a workbook lesson in A Course in Miracles. Heaven is the decision I must make. The Holy Spirit will now use the mechanism of choice, which the ego made up, to teach the mind how to choose the atonement. And that's what heaven is the decision I must make means. And what did he say, this hammer angel? He said, you could change the world. Ah, the great tempter. You could change the world. 
And then Jesus says in the Course, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. The great deceiver, the ego, is again pointing to the timeline and saying, you can change the timeline for the better. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. It's a clever little puff of nothingness. It's a good thing we have Jesus. Uh, to take us beyond this clever puff of nothingness, because it's always looking to change something in the world. Like I said before, the ego's plan of salvation is if something in the world changed, other than your own mind, <laughs> if something in the world changed, you would be happy. And the Holy Spirit's plan is if you change your mind, you've changed your purpose from one of hate to one of love, then then you'll be happy because you'll you'll go through the forgiven world and then and remember eternity. Now, even with these angels, it's kind of important because Jesus does tell us that sometimes in situations you can when the mind is in resistance, it can actually hide from the purpose in the situations. So the ego makes it kind of tricky at times when you think you're choosing well in the situation but, but you've concealed the purpose for the situation from, from awareness and then things you think you're advancing, you think you're doing something that's beneficial in form and then something goes wrong, something falls apart, something backfires, it's because that still was a desire for, for an outcome in the world, and it was just concealed. Uh, it was just, it wasn't fully uh, brought to the light. It wasn't, it wasn't brought into full awareness. And so, you know, I've talked about the secret dream, the dream you dream in secret, and then the, the dream that you gave away, which is what the perception of the world is. So as long as there's still beliefs and attack thoughts in the unconscious mind, that's when it will, it will get quite uh, disillusioning sometimes, when you still have some subtle outcomes for how it should look in the world, and then it doesn't turn out the way that you had hoped for. Um, it's because there's a deeper wish in the, in the secret dream, in the unconscious mind, that has not been exposed yet. But this is why the communication is so helpful. When, when, when you come together with your brother and sister, this is the call for transparency. The last time uh, we, we had a movie last week with Liar Liar, wasn't that, was that our first or second um, theme on there? Full, I think it was number one, full transparency. So now we're, we're one week later, we're looking at Feelings of responsibility, which are tied into guilt, which are tied into hiding private thoughts. And what's the way to undo the guilt? Is to expose and release the private thoughts. Full transparency. That's our, we're just building on last week's theme in this one. So now we're ready to start to have that kick in a bit. Because I've already told you that the hammer will try to use uh, we'll try to use the sickness card to, uh, to break this relationship up. Um, already the hammer is trying to plant the seeds of like, you have a much greater calling. What your father wanted you to be, what your brother wanted you to be, you can win this election and then additional four elections, including the presidency of the United States. And this is a typical ego uh, maneuver, where it's trying to tell you that if you become something in this world, you can help to change the world, in this case through political means. It's really not a part of the plan. You know, sometimes people say, well, it's, it's Mary Ann Williamson was a Course in Miracles teacher and she ran for Congress and she was defeated. She ran for, to try to get nominated for the presidential nomination and then it ended up being Biden. 
There are no accidents in the plan. Jesus is always taught the same thing. Seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. This is about going in your mind and changing the, the purpose with the Holy Spirit's help. This is about unwinding from false self-concepts and false roles and opening to the realization of, of forgiveness, which is buried in there in the mind, but it's still available, it's still accessible. Actually, it's, 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 you can't miss when, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and Jesus. It's not possibly accessible, it's actually inevitable. <laughs> uh, you can't miss the target <laughs> with guidance like that, because it's your destiny to, to remember who you are. It's your destiny, like the Greek the Greeks said, know thyself. It's not about changing the world. It's not about politics. It's not about trying to improve world conditions. It's not about uh, making the world a better place. It's about shifting your perception of the world and, and facing whatever you believe about the world. One time I was in Aarhus, Denmark, and there was a whole group of us, maybe like uh, and Kirsten, you were there, and Jason, and we had a whole group of us, Michael Caruana, uh, we were all there, Francis, and doing a tour of 10 countries through Europe, and we went to Aarhus, and there was a gentleman there who said he had a loft in the industrial area of Aarhus. We said, great. He said, I'll host the gathering. So we went there to the loft. You can still check this out on Spreaker and online and everything. We went there to do the gathering. What he didn't tell us was that this loft was right across the street from a slaughterhouse. I mean a slaughterhouse where animals are slaughtered. So we had vegetarians coming <laughs> to our gathering, and every day we'd have to walk down this street in this industrial aspect of Aarhus, and we'd have to walk past this slaughterhouse. Uh, and before we'd go up, to go up into the loft where we would hold the gatherings. So let me tell you, I, I lost a lot of vegetarian fans worldwide uh, from that gathering. My uh, my veg vegetarian subscribers all over the world uh, did not like what was coming through my mouth <laughs> during those days. Because, because vegetarian is so much based on not killing animals. And I was kept talking about the, the ego is the, is the death. The ego is the, the ego thoughts are the attack thoughts. The ego is what needs to be forgiven. It's, it's not what occurs in form, but it's actually the perception of what occurs in form can be distorted if you're looking through the ego's filter. And so we would kind of go there, we had to walk past the slaughterhouse every single day. But one day after we took a break, um, even when we go for lunch, we have to walk past multiple times past this slaughterhouse. Uh, not just once or twice, but every time we go there, every time we leave. We go to lunch, we have to pass and come back tw two more times, and this and this. So one time during a lunch break, I just went down there, and I, just, I, I, just, I was guided by Jesus to go over to the slaughterhouse. And so I went to the slaughterhouse, and I, I went there, and there were all these cows that were all kind of lined up. It was like a maze. They were basically all in a maze, having to walk to what would seem to be their death as they would go through into the, the slaughterhouse to be killed. But I remember making eye contact. I did a lot of eye gazing with these cows because the cows were looking at me with, um, with seemingly some fear in their eyes. And they were very... Uh, frightened and they were very uh, confused and they were looking to me so I had to communicate with them it's okay it's it, it, you don't you don't have to really worry about this you're not this body I had to do the same kind of teachings that I'm doing up in the in the workshop with humans I had to do with the cows too I had to look right into the eyes of the cows and tell them the truth 
to come, you know, to, so they, because they were curious. They were like, what's, what's happening? What's going on here? And I would say, you know, it's, I would take them beyond it in my mind to the, to the atonement uh, with these cows. And then go back and, uh, so if you ever have, want to really listen to a very interesting um, uh, gathering that we all did, just go find David Hofmeister Aarhus Denmark, <laughs> and you can hear the whole thing. Because this is the kind of things, these things would come up for people. Uh, it's not even surprising that they would come up when they have to walk past the slaughterhouse every, every day for multiple times. You better believe they, they raised the questions when we made it up to the loft. So in this case, now again, as soon as the hammer, you know, they're both in bed. They finally have their time in bed together, and then the hammer's standing at the foot of their bed. And then in the morning, when he gets up to go uh, get, get dressed and go to, to the bathroom and everything, she wakes up, she's afraid. David, 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 David. And then she gets a phone call from Adrian, her ex. Now this is, you can tell this ego defense. The ego will always use something from the past to obscure the present joining. This is no, this should almost be uh, in the manual, <laughs> in the manual for teachers. <laughs> the distractions of the ego are, seem to be endless. Whenever you start to be drawn into a very deep connection and relationship, the ego will try to sabotage the relationship. So first plan for the hammer is to get Adrian involved. Bring Adrian back into the picture immediately. You know, the first time they're in bed, Adrian's brought back. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the ego is going to use the big um, sickness body, the projection of, of, of the sickness thought onto the body, which really makes the mind uh, shake. Plus, the, the hammer has been saying, you know, you have an important purpose. You know, you're supposed to, in the plan, you're supposed to be elected four times, win four elections, and be the president, and change the world through your presidency. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. See, it's even the ego can pretend to be altruistic to keep you away from the holy instant. You see how sneaky it is? President, to change the world, you know. Oh, that's a sneaky ploy. So, bring in the old boyfriend and the sneaky ploy of President of the United States, change the world, like the Michael Jackson song, heal the world, make it a better place. No, no, that's not it. That's not the Holy Spirit. And then, finally, the sickness card, the, the some kind of symptom projected onto the body to really throw his mind into doubt. Because at this point, the ego is very threatened about this relationship and the purpose of their coming together. So it's going to use a triple threat of all three things to try to block this holy relationship. So obviously another threat from the angels. She could be famous. She could be a world famous dancer and a world famous choreographer. Yeah, the ego made all of that up. Fame is always of the ego. Humbleness is of Jesus. Humbleness is of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not destined for you to be a famous anything. The Holy Spirit is not destined for you to be accomplishing anything in time and space because the ego made time and space to keep you from knowing who you are. And now this so-called angel, who they call the hammer, has now tried to bring Adrian, the past, the past relationship, X back in. He's tried to persuade him that he needs to win the next four elections to become president and change the world. Fame, 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 fame change an illusory world that doesn't even exist. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Trying to use things of the world that the world judges good and important, but are nothing more than self-concept goals designed to keep you from the holy instant. 
All the things of this world, fame, fortune, money, control, power, as the world judges it, all of them defenses against the holy instant. That's why even people like Marilyn Monroe, who had fame, money, humor, sex appeal, all the things, ding, 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 she hits all the boxes of everything that's, that's seen to be good and valuable in the world, and she's suicidal because all of these things don't bring intimacy, happiness, they don't bring you back to God. They take you away further into the darkness that the ego made. So that's why Jesus says you can't judge your advances from your retreats because the ego built a quite intricate world of time and space and it's a, like a cobweb. It wants to have you stuck on the cobweb and never to escape that cobweb of time and space. Your life with the Course in Miracles, your life with your spirituality with the practice of the Course is designed to set your mind free from this spider web of time and space that is very sticky and it's got a lot of alluring things on it. And when you just go over to touch the cobweb, you find you can't get your hand out of that thing. And then you can't get your leg out of it. Then it's got your elbow before you know it, you're in a spider web of quicksand, believing in everything of time and space, and believing that the body is your new home, and that the success and achievement and status of that body, that personality self, the more that you succeed and the more that the other bodies succeed, it's like trying to build a, a hall of cards that really is nothing more than a tricky spider web. So this is a beautiful scene coming up because this is the hammer. He's trying to use the ex Adrian and the, the future prize of winning the presidency and changing the world. And now he's threatening him and saying, if you don't follow what we're asking of you, you will kill not only your dreams, but, but Elise's dreams. The, the, the old sacrifice of, of, of somebody else card. So this is like all of the ego's best tricks you're seeing in this movie, in this particular sequence of events, to try to persuade him to give up on Elise and to cease communicating with Elise, because the ego is too threatened by the potential holy relationship that those two could have. Okay, you can start to see we're getting down to the purpose. What is the purpose? You know, his one friend here who's reading about the same article, you know, he started to ask the other angel, you know, is it always right? And he said, well, this, we can't understand all aspects of the plan. But this is where you have to go inside and you have to pray. You have to pray to make it through these distractions. The ego is very, very clever. And it's just thrown up a whole barrage of reasons for him to shut down this connection, this communication, this relationship, you know, to give up, to go back to his old ways of, um, of campaigning and politician and telling his stories and telling his lies and so on and so forth. And, you know, the real question that starts to be coming into the mind is like, okay, what about this plan? Is this plan that these so-called angels with hats, is this the way it's supposed to go? Um, and really all, all the angels seem to be doing is they talk about this tall building and the higher-ups and they always talk about the chairman. That's what my question for you right now is, who's the chairman? If these angels are, are threatening and, and using all these sabotage maneuvers, including the hammer and all of his tactics, uh, working for the chairman, and the chairman makes all the things, 
then you really have to start to, in your own mind, you have to really take a look at the purpose. You have to really pray to Jesus about who is the chairman in your mind. I did a video one time, it's still on the internet I think somewhere, where they titled it, Who's Your Daddy? That's right, I did a video, Who's Your Daddy? Meaning, who is the one that you follow in your mind? Do you follow the voice of threats? Do you to follow the voice of demands, of coulda, woulda, shoulda? You know, do you follow the voices of the past that say, oh, you messed up, but maybe in the future you can get it right. If you work hard enough and you play the role, you can change the world if you, if you become a good something or other and do the right things. But I still have that one question, who's your daddy? And in this case, who is this chairman? <laughs> you know? that these angels with hats are following, you know. And I think this is, this is for our main character, Matt Damon. You know, he's, he's at the crossroads right here. Because this is the kind of decisions you have to make when you start to take a walk toward the light and the ego in your mind says, not so fast. I, I've had you trapped for millennium. Don't think you're just going to lickety split go back to heaven with one of these holy relationship holy instant moments don't think you're going to get you slip out of here so fast i've had you trapped for a millennium with my tricks and this is what our main character david here is going through where he has to really start to go to his heart and say what is guided for me what is truly guided for me what is it that's going to free my mind from this this egoic uh, thought system. So here we go. Now we get to see some good stuff. <laughs> you notice how intuitive he is now. You notice how intuitive. He's just making decisions in the moment. After he says, I love you, he's going through doors. He's taking her hand, he's running, he's spontaneously making one decision after the next, after the next. He says, here, take my hand, you need to see this. And this is, this sequence right here is so symbolic of how the awakening occurs. You have to just tune in to the spirit, to your intuition, and make decisions with your heart. You have to make decisions with love, aligned to the love, inspired by the love. And he doesn't have a plan, you see? He doesn't have a physical plan. He has not only walked away from his political ambitions, but he has taken on this daring plan to put on, put on a hat in the rain and go running after the one that he has this deep connection with and the love. And then when he takes her hand and she, at first, she has a lot of anger. You know, there's that belief in loss coming up, like that belief in you hurt me. And he had said, I won't, I promise I won't hurt you. But he was tempted by the, uh, the hammer <laughs> with all of the uh, different strategies and, and reasons why he, he should leave her, and there it is. You know, he's just making one spontaneous, intuitive decision after another with no destination in the form. And this is what you have to do when you follow the Spirit to the light. It's not like you can have future goals. It's not like you can follow along in some formula in some way, you have to be intuitive to be able to make these decisions with the Holy Spirit. Decide for God, for me. So he's just in the joy and the freedom and the love of, of those intuitive decisions. And we're seeing how rapid they come. First he, he says, come with me, and, and through the first door they go, they're in the Yankee Stadium, and then through the next door, they're up uh, on the streets of New York, and now they're moving along in the rain, 
and he doesn't know where he's going in form and he doesn't need to know where he's going as a body. He's going beyond the body. <laughs> he's, he's following his intuition and that's what ignites the journey. That's the only way back to the light. You know, you can't expect the past to teach you how to reach the light. You can't expect appearances to teach you how to reach the light. You can't even, you can't even count on a formula to reach the light. And even if your Course in Miracle book, remember Jesus says this Course is a beginning and not an end. And henceforth follow, listen to the voice for God, follow the steps of the Holy Spirit. Even in Lesson 189, he says, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. This is a key to going beyond the body identity. You have to follow the voice for God, you have got to follow the intuition. And to me this is a spectacular scene, because first of all he uses his buddy friend to, to learn about the hats and the doors, and now he's using what he learned from his angel friend and now he's just going totally on intuition. He doesn't even have an angel friend there with him. He's just got Elise, he's got her hand and they are together. They are moving together and this is very symbolic of moving toward the light through holy relationship. You have to be spontaneous, you have to be guided. So here we go, finally. <laughs> <laughs> so, they have just transcended the library. What is the library but intellect? Oh boy, they've just blasted their way through the intellect. You know, this isn't about figuring where the Course fits into world religions or how the book relates to things of this world. This is about piercing the veil. This is a, and look, they're in a circular, a, ascending spiral staircase upward. As soon as they blasted through the library, they are not, you know, Jesus says, beware, the ego enjoys studying itself. Jesus says this in the text. The ego enjoys studying itself. Are you going to settle for an intellectual grasp of A Course in Miracles? and still seem to grow old and sick and die? Are you going for the light? Are you going to ascend that spiral staircase? If there's a chairman to face, why wouldn't you want to face the chairman? What's to be afraid of with the chairman? When you've got Jesus and Holy Spirit with you, don't you think that ascension and holy relationship is worth it? They are zooming up there and they have blasted us in record time. They blasted through the library, they blasted through the intellect. Don't spend hundreds of thousands of years in that library. That's for the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus talked about this 2,000 years ago. The Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. A hand is very close. Don't get caught in scholars and debating scripture and, and going and constantly trying to intellectually banter things around. Get into that holy relationship and go intuitively up that spiral staircase. So here we go! Yay! We're doing it! They're doing it with us! <laughs> They're still going up! They have armed guards coming at them. These are the sentinels. Remember in the Matrix, the sentinels? They're the gatekeepers. They're the guardians. They're the ones that are employed and deployed by the ego to block you from the light. And so they still don't have a destination in form, but they're still climbing the steps. They're still going through the doors. And that's it. It's purely intuitive. They don't have a map. They have no road map. They don't have a, a destination in form. They don't have an outcome in mind. They are simply ascending and ascending and ascending and going higher and higher and higher, and yet they do not have a map and they do not have an outcome in mind. Okay, here we go. Hang in there. <laughs>
Yeah, last night I was watching the movie Next with my commentary. I was getting all elated and then I, I saw, as I was watching the movie very carefully, it said, based on Golden Boy by Philip K. Dick. And then with this movie at the end, there it is again, Philip K. Dick. It's this metaphysical writer from decades ago who's giving us all kinds of electric dream episodes and and movies, that's two movies in a row I've seen, last night and tonight, that were in, based and inspired by Philip K. Dick. So, this is just a symbol to our mind of what we're moving toward, what we're moving into. We're moving toward the intuition. We're moving towards, you have all the answers inside of you. you we're moving toward a merge where you intuitively Decide for God, for me. That's your prayer. You're going to merge with the Holy Spirit. Decide for God, for me. There's Brian. The light's coming in. Brian's there in the light. <laughs> in the center. In the center of our screen. He's all lit up. That's it. We, the intuitive way is the way of the heart. It's the, the way that takes us all the way. To the light. Everything that we learned before, everything that we did before is just stepping stones. Those were the preliminaries for us to just learn to be intuitive, to really let go of anything that we're holding on to in the world. It wasn't too long ago where I was here in the same position telling you that, you know, if you wanted to really go into a workbook lesson, lesson 128 is, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And why is that lesson important? Well, that's 128. 129 is, beyond this world is a world I want. That's the quantum field. That's the happy dream. That's the forgiven world. That's what this is all about, is seeing the world in a new way. But what a great movie at starting to see that self-concepts and even, even the projection of guilt onto the body as a sprained ankle, even all those uh, misdirections, miscommunications, misdirections didn't really stop them from going for it. Because in the end, if, if you desire it, nothing no one, nothing can stop you from remembering who you are. It, it has to mean that all of time and space will reconfigure to reflect your mind. As you let go of past regrets and future goals and worries and concerns, you automatically have to go back toward the holy instant. There's, that's the only direction that there is. You know, it's like you, you are in the tractor beam of love and, and the only thing that can keep you or delay you from going up in that tractor beam is the attempt to grab hold of something in time and space that you value more than the light. Some concept, some belief, some draw to something of time and space and, and this movie helps us see a lot of those tricks uh, were just laid bare. You know, they were totally exposed in this movie. They, they seemed to be pretty tricky and, and clever, and they even got our main character to abandon Elise there for a while and leave her in the hospital uh, and because of all the convincing that the 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 hammer was trying, to, an angel called the hammer, it's funny, the hammer was trying to convince him to, to, to not kill her dreams, along with killing his own. And he had to finally transcend that too. So, what a movie, what a great movie, what a fun adventure to start to get some of these ideas from the Course in a practical way, really see them acted out right in front of us. So let's open it up. Eric, let's see if we have some hands and see if anybody was impacted in this movie. Anybody was swirling, there's, there's Brian, 
in the light. <laughs> okay, I'll go to Brian first. Go ahead, Brian. Hey. Hey, Eric. Just waiting for, is David on the screen there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. I, gosh, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I just want to say how much I love you and um, how beautiful it is to to experience the clarity of a, of a holy relationship, you know, and I feel like my, my heart is, um, is just aflame with the, uh, the commitment to holy relationship. And that's really the, the blessing of this movie. It reminded me of Ascension through relationship, I hang the DJ a little bit, which is another, another really powerful movie that just rips my heart out that you have covered many times. And I've seen, too many times, but um, you know the commitment uh, to to holiness, and uh, um, I feel like just the you know the retirement of specialness. I don't know how else to say it. The retirement of of a uh, special relationship, and then just the the full commitment to to have holy relationship be all that matters and all that there is, and and um, you know just stand in in the uh, the uh, I don't know else to say it, the fire of, of that that beautiful fire of of presence and um, you know, allow it to you know show and reveal and light up the unconscious you know and just bring bring forth it all to to resolution and, and completion and wow uh, you know there's really nothing that can be said about that choice point but it's been made it has been made I feel. You have made it, and um, you know you represent us. You're a symbol, you know, in my in my mind, in my dream for my own decision of having made that. And uh, you know, I just want to say, bravo, brother! I love you so much, and you know, <laughs> there is, you know, there is nothing that will ever, ever, ever um, prevent the happy outcome that <laughs> that is, uh, you know, that this movie points to, and that. that that you represent and that I stand with you in representing. So I don't know uh, much, 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 not much more to say than that, but uh, just so, so deep. And, you know, these are the, the true ripples, <laughs> yeah. the ripples that, you know, going out to, you know, all throughout, uh, you know, consciousness and just, you know, unifying all the false divisions and the, uh, arbitrary false divisions that seem to define uh, separation. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Brian. You know, this is a great testimony because I met you 26 years ago, and that's over a quarter of a century ago. And even when I met you, I had people telling me from who were studying the Course that the Course breaks people apart. It takes people apart. And here we are, even if it's digitally, where you're in the light, and over a quarter of a century later, we are rejoicing together in this glorious purpose. So this is a testimony for anybody who says the Course breaks people apart. I say, oh, Holy Spirit, we know the truth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> oh. mm. Hey, Brian, I, you were muted, so if you, you can unmute yourself there. I didn't see you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So I was just I had a big smile on my face from just looking at the gallery and all the beautiful faces, and seeing, you know, even people like Stephen, who I haven't seen, and three years since I went to the quantum, I think we did a quantum immersion retreat in Mexico three years ago or so. And uh, I was just, do you remember that? I was just so, I mean, that is like, there's been, I feel like right now there's just there's like this time collapse, you know, it's like not a moment has passed. And uh, yeah, it's just beautiful to feel that there's, you know, certain, uh, holy relationship connections that, that foster this feeling of just not a moment has passed, you know, and it's just, here we are. And, uh, just, yeah. Um, I feel really, 
just a, a, a sense of joy and elation and, and just deep, deep gratitude and, and gosh, a sense of wonder at, at what, what uh, you know, how this is all going to play out, but also a certainty that happy outcome has been assured. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, all, it's all working together for good. Beautiful. Thank you, Brian. Anna's here too. She remembers the quantum immersion. She was here too. <laughs> and there's Julie nodding. <laughs> this is like a reunion, a quantum immersion reunion. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go to Annie next. Go ahead, Annie. Oh, boy. Uh, well, that movie was so, so helpful for me. And uh, it was interesting because today I was just uh, really horrid to my husband. And it came like out of, I don't know, it was like I, I did it once and then I was like, what am I doing? And and then it, it kind of happened again. And uh, and then even, ag even again, you know, and I... Uh, and I was wondering what the heck I was doing. And then I watched the movie and I was like, I think that's exactly what it is. It's like ego coming in and uh, sabotaging. And I, and I, I mean, we've, people have talked about that, that that happens. You know, things go well or you get close and then ego comes into sabotage. But this movie made it so clear. But um, David, if I can ask a question that I know you've answered it four million times, but it's still... A sticking point for me, which is um, well, okay. So you mentioned the idea that there's a time appointed for all of us to wake up, but uh, so which means, which seems to mean there's no free will. You know that it's it's going to happen at a specific time, and you can't change it. But that's also confusing because if time is simultaneous, then how can there be a specific point? Or I I just don't understand simultaneous time, but the I guess I get confused about the fact that it doesn't matter what we do. I still can get sucked into hypotheticals because it does seem like if I change my mind about, about the world, if I change my mind in a specific instance about what I'm seeing, then there will be a different outcome, right? If I changed my mind about something my husband did today and I stepped back and saw it you know, with forgiveness, then I wouldn't have said the things I said. And then there would have been a, you know, a happier aftermath or, you know, I could see it in all sorts of things in my life where if I, I'm very patient with my daughters, then, then things go smoothly. And if I lose my temper, then, you know, things can keep getting worse. So it really does seem like there's effects from my changing my mind. So it does seem like I have an effect on form. and. So I, I get so confused. I've heard, I've heard you talk about the script is written lots of times, but it, it's sort of like, is it a thing we just can't understand? Because I, I feel like I never, I never get it. Beautiful. Well, we, we have been, revisited the script is written thing uh, recently, but actually the, it's a two-part question. The first part was, was, where is the free will in all of this? And what we learn from the Course, actually in the Manual for Teachers and the Clarification of Terms, Jesus clarifies that, that God's will is free will, and that free will is, God's will for us is perfect happiness, and only in heaven is there free will. So that helps right away, even though it's in the Clarification of Terms, Jesus is saying, God's will is free will is for perfect happiness. And Jesus is also says in the workbook that a, a son of God, a perfect child of God, can only know perfect happiness in the environment in which it, Christ was created. In other words, heaven is the realm of free will. So God did give free will, but see what happens throughout history, like philosophy, there's a big discussion in philosophy throughout the centuries of free will versus determinism. But you see, that's back in the world of opposites. Free will is thrown as an opposite to determinism. And, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 free will is in heaven. This is a world of opposites that the ego invented. 
So free will then gets associated with choice. And you see free will is not choice. Because in heaven there's only oneness. So free will is, is not, has nothing to do with choice. So that's the first one right there. We've just solved the age-old philosophical conundrum about free will versus determinism that's been going on for many centuries. It's all solved right there in the, in the clarification of terms. Now, what is choice? It's, it's a reverberation or a reflection of free will in this world, but it's not free will itself. Just like we have reflections of love here, but, but it's not the actual love. God has to take the final step. Perfect oneness doesn't know of separation, so there are no reflections in heaven, because there's nothing to be reflected. You know, there's, there's no, no form in heaven. God knows not form. So, in terms of this world, you could say that since choice is a, a reflection of free will, what that means is heaven has to take the form of a decision because the mind made up opposites. The ego is the belief in opposites. Now, the heaven has to take the form, or the correction I'll call it, has to take the form of a, of a choice. And that choice is really an acceptance. It's not like a choice between do I have, wear the red dress or the blue dress, or do I eat the apple or the banana. Those, aren't, those are pseudo choices made up between images. But there is a choice in the mind between, we'll say, the right mind and the wrong mind. You know, in the end, if you go deep enough, you have a choice to make between the ego and the Holy Spirit. Between the wrong mind and the right mind. And that is the decision for heaven. To really go all the way intuitively with the Holy Spirit's guidance takes you to a decision in mind. And that's the one I was referring to in Lesson 158. You know, that the mind has already determined at some point that it's that the Holy Spirit is the only real alternative. That at some point it has to dawn on the mind that the ego isn't really an option. <laughs> that death is not an option. And that's the the point of surrender. You might say merging back into the light. You know, saying, uh, oh I was mistaken about all the opposites. None of the opposites were, were real. They were all false, false evidence, false doors. They weren't a, really a doorway at all. They, there was no way to go through any of the death wishes. All the, like the anomaly in Matrix, you know, when he's, when he's with the architect and all the, the TV screens, the monitors are there and he's screaming and shouting and all of them. All the anomalies are seen for what they are. So really that's the two parts. Number one is you just let go of the idea of free will in this world because there is no free will in time and space. Um, this world of opposites is what we could call hell. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's definitely not heaven. Opposites. There are no opposites in oneness. So this, this projected world of time and space and seeming opposites is, is what you could call hell. You don't have to worry about a fiery eternal hell because there is no burning in hell. It's just the illusion of, of trying to make up something other than God and to, to try to make a will apart from God's will for perfect happiness. And definitely this world of opposites is not perfect happiness. <laughs> That's pretty obvious by the, uh, by, by the daily experiences. So thank you for that. And also I did recently answer that, that it's like you can't ever really understand the script is written because it's just like a metaphor for lesson number seven, I see only the past. That's all the script is written means. It's just a version of lesson number seven in the workbook. Uh, I see only the past. Now, now that's not the that's not the atonement, uh, because the atonement is the awareness that the separation never happened. So, I see only the past must be just a, a rung on the ladder. Just like in this movie, how they were running through the library, and maybe one of the books on the shelf of the library says the script is written. You can run past that one too. Uh, you know, that's just a, a, a metaphor in the library. You know, there's still some stairways 
to go to go higher and eventually to go up to the daylight, to the roof, uh, to, to be in the bright light. That's what they did. And you notice when they got up there, there still were the dark figures surrounding them. But they just, they both said, I love you. And they came together and they embraced and they kissed and they gave themselves totally over to the love. And then the dark ones disappeared. And then even the hammer, <laughs> the hammer had to admit he was wrong <laughs> and, and walk away. Even the hammer, the angel, you know, because the chairman, you know, gave a destiny for them to be, it was showing in the book, to be together. So that's, that's really the true chairman, that's the Holy Spirit, you know, that you are together, you will forever be together. So thank you for, for bringing that up. That's going to bring clarity for, for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> you know yeah. what also has been really helpful is uh, from Liar Liar, that image of um, Jim Carrey trying to uh, say that whatever say that the pen was red or blue and you it was freeze framed and I thought ah oh, that's just been so so helpful for me as a, representing the feeling that you have like why it is we suffer when we go against you know what what what's what's right mindedness yeah yeah oh, thank glad. you so much oh I'm glad you brought that scene up because that was the scene when. He was so afraid of losing his case and, and he couldn't tell a lie, so he went in that room to use his so-called free will, to use the power of his will to say that a blue pen was red. And he couldn't, he couldn't get the word out. He, wee, wee, you know, he, tried, he couldn't even say the word red. And then at the end, He's got the pen, the blue pen over him, like, and then he falls to the ground and he comes up and it's blue, blue written on his face and blue ink everywhere, you know. The blue prevailed. You've got blue behind you too, beautiful blue triangles and sparklies. That's like the, the Holy Spirit wins out. Look, you've got no red there. It's just blue is, blue is dominant. In fact, if we go back to, uh, to Brian, I think right next to Brian, I was noticing a big, bright, blue ball. Blue, blue, blue is dominant tonight. So that's just saying that the will of God prevails over, there it is, with Brian, the blue ball. The will of God prevails over all things. And we can only merge with the will of God. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think I'll go to Esther next. Go ahead, Esther. You say so much, David, and I try to absorb it all. Sometimes I have to re-listen a couple times. <laughs> um, what's been going on for me is, is a lot of what you describe. Um, I just have to put it in my own words, I guess, um, that this idea of wanting to kill myself when the thoughts and feelings are um, like overwhelming. And um, what helps me is uh, my friend Alan will tell me, well, who is this I? And, and if you're not the body, then what are you actually killing? And, um, and then when I read on um, uh, Suava's posting, she said something about, um, thinking of the I am presence and I was thinking, well, gee, I, I've been thinking about such surface things like guidance for this and guidance for that. And, and then Alan reminded me that just by changing the, um, focus on the feelings and the thoughts and seeing them now as meaningless, um, and then seeing that you're observing them. And then there's a place, I think you said today, that, that's when the observer and the observed merge. And, um, and another thing you said that I, I liked very much was um, I, something about this oneness that, that the I am presence, that you just experience it because you're not, I think you said, because you're not thinking about anything else. You're just everything's cleared away. And, and so 
Alan said to me, you know, you never, you don't talk to David like this when you're, when you're suicidal and you don't tell him that you're, that you're um, having troubles with your thoughts and feelings. And I said, no, I don't. And he says, well, you tell me all the time. And I said, <laughs> so we were just, we were just laughing about how I get into this space with you that nothing of that stuff comes up, but I wanted to share with you that it does come up and that I work with it and, and he helps me and that these, um, these, like, I, I also, I talked to, I, I mean, I, I wrote to Kirsten one night, I was telling her that something about, oh, fake it until you make it. Like the, um, the, 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 I choose the, the joy of God instead of pain. That was the lesson I was doing that night. And, um, and I just felt like I was having to fake the idea that Jesus loves me and that I'm loved. And then I realized that that it must have just been doubt because if there's nothing other than love, there's nothing opposite to love then. And then this whole idea of worthiness came up with um, Margot's posting in Mighty's about how she felt unworthy in relationship to her sister and money and stuff like that. And I wrote a posting back. I said, you know, it all has, I was doing it for myself that the, uh, it's about identity confusion and, and that, um, Oh, and that the unworthy and worthiness is, is a meaningless thought. And we're equating with what we are, uh, to be, uh, uh, a concept, a self-concept that would have the, the, have those thoughts and feelings and that we associate that those thoughts and feelings are what we are. And I just wanted to tell you that I had a really nice experience today. Um, I didn't know what to say to the psychiatrist that I had to talk to today. And Alan said, well, let's just set everything aside. And I just started laughing. And we had such a nice joining, he and I, and I told him that he's the best doctor I've ever had, and he was very happy about that. And it's really true, he really is. And um, <laughs> and I was just in such a great space. I was in such a great space. I was really lighthearted, and I shared with him that I'm working with thoughts and feelings and, and, not to, and to observe them and not to um, identify that that's who I am. And he didn't expound on that. I thought maybe he might, but I'm just having so much fun with this, even though I had suicidal thoughts so much. And it's like, I think about how it's just looming there, those thoughts there to, to commit suicide and an encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Esther. It actually, um, this morning I got a, on Facebook Messenger, I got this long message of a friend, a friend of mine. And he was so happy he couldn't contain himself because he was writing out how when he was in his early 20s, he had this full-blown mystical experience. And it just changed him forever. And it lasted for weeks and weeks. And it was he was so high. And then... Um, he seemed to come back da down from it, and then people reacted to him, and they said, what, what's wrong with you? He was diagnosed. They gave him drugs, psychiatric treatment, um, prescribed all kinds of things to him, counseling and everything like this. And I recently, I saw him earlier this year, and he was... He was so happy, but he was writing today that he said he's been going through all these speakers, you know, just these audios, and sp layers, speakers and speakers and speakers. But he found this one speaker, he said, David, David, you were talking about Kirsten's mystical experiences, and you were talking about Svava's mystical experiences, and when I was listening to the speaker, I sprang back into my mystical experience when you were talking about Svavas and Kirsten's. And he was like, and I just play that same speaker, that same part of the same speaker over and over. 
And he's so happy. <laughs> he had the right to tell me that it's like it's triggering him. You know, he's getting triggered by by hearing me speak about these in the in the way I'm speaking about them. So I think that's the key, like with with you and Alan, when you can join like we're joining, and then when you can join with Alan right there for you, your mighty companion, your holy relationship, and then you can both burst into laughter, then that's the piercing. You know, that's like that's how you break through. Because when you're in that laughter, oh, everything is all right with the whole world, you know. There's nothing the ego can do when you go into that laughter, you know. It's, it's powerless uh, when you go into that laughter. So that's the thing I would focus on. Just keep joining with, with Alan in that way. Share whatever you need to share. Don't hide anything, don't hold anything back. And, and just remember to laugh. Remember to come back to that that point of laughter where you just feel so wonderful and so free. That's the, that's the best. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. <laughs> oh, precious. Precious, precious. Okay, I think I'll go to Laura next. You can go ahead, Laura. Okay. Oh boy, this whole evening has been an experience. <laughs> um, um, uh, just like, for example, right now, um, the e I put my hand up really early because I wanted to share something, and, I, and the ego is just coming in full force, you know, impatience and. And why won't I, was or the ego was convinced that Eric was waiting to call on me, you know, like trying to piss me off. And, and, I was like, <laughs> and, then, and then Esther was like, Esther said, um, having so much fun with it and remembering to laugh. And then you said, remembering to laugh. And then I was like, yes, remembering to laugh about all this stuff. And then earlier in the movie, I had this realization and it came in more like a, it's like you, I, I've heard you say so many things so many times and it like all clicked together in mind for me. And it wasn't just an intellectual experience because I could feel it. Like, um, I wrote some stuff down because that's what I do, but, um, Everything that happens to me is what I have asked for and what happens is what I desire. And I have struggled with that over and over and over and over again. And I understood it intellectually, but it like all came together with what you were saying. And then I was just like lit up, but then ego kept coming in over and over again about, I, cause I knew I felt like I wanted to share that and um, ego just kept coming in. And then you'd pause the movie and you'd say something. It was like Holy Spirit was speaking to me to encourage me to share what, what, what I was wanting to say. And just in, as, a, as an example, I was like, one of the thoughts that I had, the ego thought was, um, well, I don't, I'm not sure how to explain this or because it, it, I wasn't sure what words to say or whatever. And the thought came in to say what I had said previously, that it wasn't an intellectual understanding it was more of a feeling and that's like just I had that thought and then just a few minutes later you paused the movie and you were talking about them ascending up the staircase bashing through the the library and bashing through the intellect and I was like yes <laughs> <laughs> like everything in this movie was just reinforcing Holy Spirit and me sharing and oh and then when Brian was talking um, I realized that I had um, a prayer before this movie. Um, I had taken a break from the movies for a while because I had just, I really took a dive into ego and I, I wanted to not be on the movies and just kind of journal with spirit and that kind of thing. Um, and I really felt to be on the movie tonight. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then um, I had a prayer 
to, well, I don't want to say the prayer yet, but when, when, um, <laughs> when um, Brian was talking, uh, I had the realization that the prayer was realized and that the prayer was that I wanted an experience. I wanted to experience um, joy and um, whatever, an experience instead of just an intellectual understanding. Because usually when I was coming to these movies, um, it was all about the movie. And I know I've struggled with this in the past or seemingly struggled with, with this in the past where it's all about the movies and I was afraid that I would miss something or, you know, it was more about me watching the movie and, it, and what I, it was more about the movie than me having an experience. And so that was my prayer and that's what happened. And so I'm like really excited. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Great, Laura. That's fantastic. That's it. Answer to prayer. Yeah. Experience. That's it. That's beautiful. I did have one more question. Um, you mentioned, and I've heard you mention this before, uh, the omega and the, what's the other thing? Alpha. Yeah, what are you talking about when you talk about that? I have no, <laughs> <laughs> no clue. <laughs> I think it's, it's think it's Greek Greek terms, but alpha and omega are just beginning and end. So Jesus was just saying, "I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end," which is really his way of kind of talking about simultaneity. You know, uh, because if if he's both, <laughs> then then that's a whole new experience there. If he if he's both, because in the world of opposites, they're different. And then he says, "I am the Alpha and the and the Omega." He's he's saying he he contains it all. So that's just his way of inviting us to the correction. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll go to you, Stephen, next. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. Um, David, that was so much fun. I've got to get my hat on here. because <laughs> <laughs> You're ready for the doors. Go bring on the doors. <laughs> hey, man, I tell you what, I, I love that in the doors. I just see the doors in my mind. It goes to the miracles. And so you just, okay, I need, I need the guidance. And, and, and as you were sharing, just follow your intuition. I don't need a plan. Don't need outcomes. Can let go of all that. And just go, go for the doors. Go, get into the feeling. Get into the intuition. And, and just keep, keep happening. And don't go for the ascent. I, I really liked that. And I liked how um, when they were, they were going that rooftop scene, uh, I'm pretty sure that was the same place where the ending of Vanilla Sky was filmed. You know, they pop out of the door, and then they make the final leap. There's the embrace, um, and, and he makes the leap for the final dream. But I, I, I liked how that played out in terms of keep keep going, keep going. Um, I, I had a funny experience today, and it's no coincidence for me that this movie was the one that was selected because I'm driving around today, and a couple things happened. One was, I, for some reason, I was thinking about the words, I've got to have a game plan. And I just thought that was funny, that word game plan. And I thought about the movie The Game, and then here everybody always talks about huddle up, we've got to get a game plan, we've got to put together a game plan. And I just thought that's ridiculous, uh, you know, the whole game plan idea. And then here this movie rolls out with the, the, the plan and the script and all that. So I thought, well, that wasn't coincidental. And I had a, 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 another experience where I was listening to um, uh, Summer Breeze from Seals and Crops, and I love that song. It just has a great feeling to it. And I was running some errands, and then I always hit this spot um, where the satellite cuts out. And, and there's a few places in town where I know it's like, okay, the, the satellite's going to cut out. And it's just that interruption of the signal. And it wanted to annoy me. I wanted to get annoyed by that because, like, ah, no, not at this part. You know, there's certain parts of songs you just don't want it to be interrupted. And then I just chuckled. I said, no, I'm not even going to get annoyed by this. This is what happens. And then I thought, I'm the interruption. The signal is always there. The satellite's always beating down. And I'm, I'm the one. I'm, the, this self-concept called me, that's the interruption. And so there was the lesson in it in, in the immediate moment where I just chose not even to be upset by this. It's just kind of how it goes on. But the song is just always playing in my mind anyway. Um, Summer Breeze. And here's the song we need to uh, play.
I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, miracles. Yeah, I know that song. <laughs> We'd get by. Anyway, another song, and it's just the, the miracles of it. A couple of other points. Um, her name, Elise. It was, I had to look it up, so I said there's always something there for us. God is my oath. <laughs> Pledge to God is what Elise means. It's French for pledge to God. God is my oath. Oh. And, and I, I love that because then I saw her in that joining and at some point when he was talking about, uh, I think he was talking to the hammer and, you know, what he could be in that whole distinction between the fame and the worldly pursuits and then the happiness that, that if he was with her, he would, that that would be so fulfilling. He would never need anything because he had made that connection, that holy relationship. And I think he said, or the hammer said, she is enough. And I just love the feeling of that, of that connection. That's the holy relationship, the Holy Spirit. I often think of it as in a, in a she, kind of the, the virgin, the rose, the mother, the trinity, and all that. But I just thought, yeah, that's it. That's, that's what's going on in my dream. I mean, that relationship is so exquisite and beautiful. And then, yeah, then there's the interruption of the signal, and that's me um, getting in the way and, and getting, you know, learning how to jump off the scholarship, get off that ship, and just get into this beautiful feeling of, and, and man, these just movies are coming around and so um, fun. And I just was here tonight with note after note after note and just thinking, yep, yeah, okay, this is good. It's just get, getting clearer and clearer. So I, I just want to say thank you again. Appreciate it so much for all this good stuff and just kind of cracking me open um, to be able to just join with all y'all and join in that holy relationship and make those adjustments as I go along. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, you always find extra points, so I'll remember that. David is reunited with the Pledge for God. <laughs> That's a good one. for. I've shown an adjustment bureau many times, but I'll remember that one. David reunited with the Pledge for God. That's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, next is Helena. Go ahead, Helena. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Hi, Helena. Hi. Um, thank you for this movie. Um, it certainly stirred me. Um, the part that I started to cry was when he said to her, do you trust me? And she said, okay, and she went with him, and off they went. Oh, so what's happening for me is, um, you know, you suggested to go to Spain at the guidance retreat, and I needed to hear it within myself, and I did. I heard the prompt internally to fill out the application, and I shared that with my husband, and he said, you don't have my blessing. I don't want you to go. And I think that broke my heart. Like, I wanted his blessing. Like, them together, I, I want that partner who's, like, all in, you know? And You know, I've... I did feel proud of myself because in that moment I said, well, I understand how you feel, but I may have to go forward and fill out the application anyways. I sort of gave myself that permission. But like he left her at the hospital because of that threat, I, I abandoned that application for like a week. But I heard the prompt again, and last night I filled it out. And... I shared that with Danny this morning and he said, I don't trust this. I don't trust your guidance. I don't trust it. And yeah, it just feels like a bit of grieving going on inside. Like um, the wife, <laughs> the wife concept is dismantling and things feel like they're falling apart. And I heard your words in my mind, like, let it crumble, let the chips fall where they may. And it's like, whoa, I think I appreciate this movie because, well, you 
pointed out that the ego will pull out lots of stops and it's like if they're all coming out if there's covid there's i mean all these reasons not to go for it you know there's leaving the children leaving my family like a good wife doesn't do that you know it, none of this makes sense in the world's terms and in, in the world yeah this doesn't make sense but but i hear it and it's like <laughs> I told them, like, I can't not listen to my heart. And I'm not really attached to the outcome of Spain. It's like, I told them that. I was like, if I go, I go. But it's the step. It's like, I, I, need, I, I needed to take the step. And I took the step. And that's like, I just like them going up the steps. <laughs> I just need to keep taking one step at a time. And I have no plan. I have no idea what this is going to look like. I was moving out for four days. Like, everything's like... And, like, yeah, I just... I thank you for this movie because it's, like, the encouragement. And, yeah, just a strong demonstration of, like, where I am, where I just keep going up those steps with the Holy Spirit, he is like, I think what feels most stable right now, because everything feels like really wonky. And, and I mean, my mighty companions are part of that stability. And so I just thank you <laughs> for this. And um, yeah, it, it means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Helena. I'm so with you. And this movie is, always touches me because there was that point when they finally do come together, Elise and David. And then, actually, uh, when she gets the call from Adrian, you know, he just comes over and he sits right next to her on the bed and he starts to just ask her questions. Like, uh, when did you break up with Adrian? Mm, three months ago. Mm. And And... We were engaged. Hmm. Uh, you know, he even makes a joke after she says that they just broke up three years, three months ago, and they were engaged. And then she says, well, he was a great choreographer and a great dancer. Basically, she's saying he's a great guy. And to which he's just so open. He says, well, why didn't you marry him? <laughs> you know, I thought you loved the encounter, you know. And she's like, Finally, she just looks him in the eye and she just said, because, because of you. Like there was some kind of deep, deep calling in spite of all the evidence. Engaged, dancer, choreographer, the same th things that she's interested. It's compatible, compatible and everything, but the, because of you. Because she said, I felt something with you even briefly, that I never ever have felt again. So that was her reason for not marrying him. And then it came back around again where she's supposed to marry the second try with Adrian, and yet he goes, puts on his hat, goes running through the rain <laughs> against all odds, so to speak, like the, like the, the song, and then goes there and again now she's even angry. She, you hurt me, you know, and, and all this, but still, it's, I think that's where you just trust the vibrational destiny, that, that if you are called, that it will, it must come around that you get the, you get the witness of, I trust you. You know, because a lot of us have faced that, I don't, I don't trust you. I heard it many times, over the years, where sometimes I would come to these critical points and I would just pour my heart out. I remember I even did it with my mother one time. I, I was in my 20s, I poured my heart out, and I said, I, I need to, I, I'm so called, I, I feel a new purpose in my life, a new direction and everything, and, and she looked at me straight in the eye and she said, it's too late. <laughs> and I mean, your mother tells you it's too late, and I, uh, that's kind of like you're doing, you pour it all out to Danny, and Danny goes, I don't trust your guidance, you know, that's like Evelyn going, it's too late, you blew it, <laughs> it's like, 
I blew it. <laughs> right. But see, but see that it doesn't end there. You know, it it doesn't end there. For me, it was like I blew it. Well, <laughs> okay. It's like I had to go regroup. Okay, Spirit, let's pray again. <laughs> let's, you know. But see, you just you have that spark inside. You're not you're not going down with a wit with one witness. You know. <laughs> If a witness tells you that, because it's too important, you know, it's like there's something inside that, like you said, I heard it again, it came back again, and and there's nothing special about Spain, and and there's nothing uh, special. What's her name? Uh, Jiska Jiska is going to be going over there, and all this, but there's nothing special about it. It's, but it is. It does come down to. Um, I I trust that if I follow my heart, and I feel my heart opening, and I feel this love opening, I trust that the witnesses will be there. Just like in this movie, you know, he had his one friend that came through for him, and then when he took her hand and they just started running uh, through the doors, they the doors kept coming and they kept going, and she had her hesitation. That's when she used started crying when he said, you please trust me, please, on the street, just please just trust me. And she just, that was a key point, you know, for her to say, okay, I guess I trust you. But that's, this is how it goes. This is how it's gone for me in my life, you know, I just really going for it, really going for it. And then the witnesses just start coming and coming, and then they come more, and then there's more, and then the momentum and the confidence in the d direction comes stronger and stronger. I think the part of the text I think that would would be good for you to read is the branching of the road. Because that's the part in the text where Jesus is saying, you, you come to the branching of the road, and then when you take your first few steps on the new direction, that's when the ego loses it. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. You, it wants you to stay. There's nothing more painful, he says, than standing at the branch of the road and not taking a direction. There's nothing more painful than standing there and not taking the real alternative, not taking the direction. But once you do take the first few steps, that's when the ego freaks. Because it's like, oh, no. She's going for the, the light. She's going for escape. And that's the thing that the ego can't stand, you know. So, but that's a really good section. I know I, I read that section when I was really at a, at a pivotal point. And I know you probably have seen uh, Francis talk about this a lot too, because we did that video recently about um, going beyond normal. And um, she was facing the same kind of things, where she, she just poured her heart out to her mother, she poured her heart out to her husband, and she just said, I, this is so strong, I think I have to go for this, because I want to learn how to, to love unconditionally, is what she was telling them. You know, like, I'll never be satisfied without knowing unconditional love. That I have it, that I am it, that I have it to give away and, and experience. And then they said, good, good, love, you're doing this for love. Love us, love us. <laughs> That's what they, Francis, little Francis, you know, she's got her husband Tim and her mother and the family. If you want to love, love us. Forget the world, <laughs> forget the love everyone part. Just love us, practice with us. And she said, well, let me take that in and think about that. And she said, no, I think 25 years down the road, I'm going to be very unhappy <laughs> that I that I went for that decision. You know, she actually played it out in her mind. You know, where she said, "Okay, just let me play." She went like 20 years ahead. I'm going to be resentful. <laughs> You're not going to want to be living with me <laughs> if if I don't go for this because of this a feeling. I have to learn to love everyone. I have to. Trust Jesus, you know, and there have been many people have said, you know, families that have said, no, that's not what Jesus says in the Bible. Jesus 
is never saying that, but actually, if you actually look at some of those scriptures of mother turned against daughter and father against son for my namesake, and there's a number of places where he's kind of describing the branching of the road even 2,000 years ago. When you're reading the red letters, the scripture in there, you can start to go, oh, oh it's, it's actually in there. And then people will say, no, no, that's not what Jesus meant, you know, and, you know, so this is why the Course is really helping us. It's like giving us the full context. And then the Mighty Companions who really go for it, they, Francis has a lot to share about that. You know, like, like oh my God, two roads diverged in a woods and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. You know, the Robert Barrett Browning, or isn't it Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Robert Browning poem, yeah, The Road Less Traveled. Yeah, that's a very famous poem about choosing the road less traveled. And Jesus had something to say about that 2,000 years ago, about the one road that leads, um, that most follow. And then he talked about this other branch. He was describing the branching of the road 2,000 years ago, and he called it the straight and narrow. <laughs> that's narrow. <laughs> you know, he's describing too about how it's it doesn't, fit with the, the concepts of the world. So we're right there with you, and, and that's the best thing. Um, you know, it, you walk in faith, you have to follow that deep feeling in your heart, and then from that faith, the witnesses show up. Uh, and, and they do, they never fail to show up. They show up with their arms outstretched saying, I'm here for you. And, and that's part of for that witness to show up, you're saying, I need that partner, I need that witness to show up that, that joins with me in this, that's, that says, you're right, and I'm with you 100%. You know, that's what you're looking for, and it starts with your heart. It starts with your heart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Neat. Okay, I'll go to Robert next. Go ahead, Robert. Okay. Uh, hi, David. Hi, Robert. Ah, there you are. Good. Um, yeah, a hey, uh, great, great movie. Uh, thanks again for for all you do for. Uh, hosting it and all that. Um, yeah, you know, when you were talking about uh, the reason why I'm here is there's something of time and space I still find attractive. You know, it just got me uh, just searching my mind for what that could be. <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, in form, I really can't see any reason why I would ever want to come back here. I'm just thinking, it's just, I guess it's just got to be the guilt. I mean, I got some guilt that I got to release, and the guilt's going to keep bringing me back. That's the only thing I can come up with. But uh, the, well, the, the theme for this uh, movie, was it responsibility? Yeah, was that feelings, of, feelings of responsibility, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, kind of tailor that a little bit for me as a steward of the monastery. Um, I, I ask myself these questions and I just, I keep giving myself the same answer, just be authentic. But as far as like, uh, like for example, when I was over at uh, Casa de Milagros, um, I was getting called out on every little thing, you know, just didn't matter, just pfft, no, no private thoughts. And uh, that was a devotional stay, though. That was not cold living. And cold living, I find that, you know, people come here and different, their mind is in different places. Some are, you know, really strongly devoted and others not so much. And I was just kind of wondering, um, maybe if you could just kind of talk a little bit about, uh, how that should look like for me as far as speaking to every little thing that I see. Am I just being too micromanagey or just, 
you know, that, how, how I should go about that. Yeah, I think the, the steward role, when Jesus gives the, you the steward role, it's like, it's always a lesson for our, our mind. So to me, when I think of steward, like, Jesus had 12 apostles, and then among the apostles, one of them was designated as a steward. Because there were so many logistics. They had travel. This is talked about in the Urantia uh, book. I think it was Andrew uh, was the steward. And there were so many logistics. Travel, food, lodging, lots and lots of logistics for, for 13 guys moving around through Galilee. Uh, for a few years, and Andrew was a very good steward. He he, because it has to do with with purpose. Like um, they had some they had some funds. They had a, a little. Uh, Matthew had carried some funds, and um, Judas carried the purse sometimes. But but basically, they had their donations, and and Matthew would put some of his money in to help them out. But but it was the purposeful use of the things of time and space, which is a way to start to align your mind with the with with the Holy Spirit. Because the things of time and space don't mean anything in and of themselves. But it's the purpose for which they're used that's very important. So I know that when I was in the 1990s, uh, actually before I met Brian, um, 26 years ago, I was actually had a, a little community down in Cincinnati and then a community up in uh, Michigan. And then going out to Denver, I had a community, and there's then uh, another part of Michigan. So I've had a series of, of communities that I've been involved with, but for me, when I was given like a steward kind of role, it was like the Spirit was saying, I want you to listen to what I have to share with you because I want you to learn how to use resources for the good of the whole. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. I was like, good of the whole? What's the good of the whole? He said, the whole universe. And I'm like, the universe? Oh my God. And he said, well that's, time and space are just neutral, so I need you to practice using things in a way that will be a blessing to everybody. Because under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, everybody wins. It's win, 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 win. Everybody gains. Everybody advances with, with this. It's the ultimate of fairness, but it relies on a lot of guidance. And he said, you, at the time he was saying, I, you still have these preferences and these blocks in your mind that block you from really being a good steward. So I thought, okay, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to give this a go. And then progressively over the many, many years, it's still about stewarding, it's still about stewarding. You know, this, today I had like three WhatsApp messages, I had a Facebook Messenger and everything, and I'm still, there I am, okay, all right, Jesus, call, he says, call this one, then call this one, then call this one, then do this. You know, it's still like even stewarding my time during the day as I join. There was a woman, um, there was interesting, a woman wrote to me a while back and then she wrote to me again and she sent a Facebook messenger, a, a, a file attached, and I, I couldn't open it on my phone, but she was from Argentina. What was her, her name? What was her name? Man, man? Marcia. Marcia. So I thought, I tried to open it on my phone, it was just all gibberish. So then I said, oh, I'll, I'll open it upstairs in my computer. And then when I did it, all it said was co-living file. That's all it said was co-living file. I knew the, the name of it, but I didn't know what it said. So then when I went into it, co-living, I thought maybe she was going to ask about co-living. Like there where you are, or, or in Spain, or in Mexico. No, she, she was saying, I have a room, I have recently divorced, I have two young children, and I have a room, and I want to charge $300 a month, or so much a day, 30, 
thirty dollars a day, and she said, I, "I I need a mighty companion." Kind of in her own words, she was saying to join. I I want to follow Jesus, and I've got these kids. I'm divorced, but I. She wanted to make a co living room, a space in her one of her bedrooms in her house, and so I thought, oh. And I went back, I read her earlier message, and then I made a, a group with, with Marina and myself and a WhatsApp. And then we ended up having a WhatsApp call, the three of us. And she was, she was in the van with her two kids in the back, just as happy as could be. She was just smiling. And, and you know what she was just doing? She wrote this little co-living document just for her to join with Jesus and join with the Mighty Companion right where she was in her circumstances. And that just shows me, that's what stewarding is about. It's a prayer of the heart to let things, let the Spirit come through you in a way that blesses everyone. And that's what you're doing right now. You're, you know, I don't think, of course the ego will try to break it apart and analyze it and nitpick it, you know, with this one and that one. But you're just cultivating that loving attitude, the, like the Beatitudes in your heart, where you just want to cultivate a loving, harmonious connection and relationship with yourself and with everyone. And Jesus is saying, yeah, and that does involve some of the logistics there at the monastery. That's, the, that's like your backdrop, your theater, for uh, coming into deeper purpose and alignment with the stewarding. So, uh, for some for you it's stewarding, for, for some people, like for Svava, it's her songs. She, she never composed songs before, she, she never did any of the things. And then mixing and mastering, it was like she just gave herself over. With, with Marina, with Anna, Anna Cecilia, it's, it's translating. So much translating is pouring through them, like a lot is pouring through them. And they're just willing to use the translation, like you're using the stewarding there at the monastery. And for everyone, it's, a, it's just a little bit different, you know. I mean, Ken got activated to do a gardening. He built a wall. He went over there and basically built a, a, a wall over there at La Casa because he was so inspired that the, the people over there could hardly catch up with him. He almost had the wall built before they could, you know, get their, their gloves and get their gear on. You know, he was almost done because he was like here at this house and he was so activated that he just told everybody here, I gotta go, out the door, it builds a wall. You know, it's, it's that activation of letting the Spirit move through you in whatever you're given. And I know for me, I, I didn't like to speak, but then Jesus is like, well, we're gonna, I'm going to speak through you. Me? Where? In public? In public! I'm not supposed to talk about God in public. Yes, you are. You know, it, you know, it, it was a the surrender thing of, of giving it over and saying, okay, I'll do what you're giving to me because as you allow yourself to be stewarded through, then you come into deeper alignment with, with the Holy Spirit. And then the ego will try to pick it apart, but there will be times where you just take take time out to pray. Just say, if you offer something as a gift and somebody says, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. Robert, I'm not doing it. You know, you're not there to, to correct anybody. You're not there to make anybody do anything. This isn't like the military, you know, where, you know, you got to offer, you give her the commands and then people are supposed to follow what the commands are. Jesus told me, he said, when you work with people, never confront people, never uh, command people, never demand anything from people. He said, you just offer what I give through you as like a free offering. And with the gift that you offer, he says, I'll, I'll send it through you. Basically, you have to give everyone the option to take it or leave it. Because if you don't give the option... <laughs> to take or leave the gift, then that's coercion. You can't say, here's a gift and you better take it, or else. That's like the angels in this movie, you know. Oh, you'll ruin, you'll kill her dreams too. And, you know, if you don't do it, we're going to delete all the thoughts in your brain. 
Yeah, like, right, like Jesus would say that. What would Jesus do? No way would Jesus put, put a hook at the end of the gift. And yet the ego always wants to put a hook at the end of the gift. Like, here's my gift, and you say yes, or else I'll hook, I'll hook you. <laughs> you see how it's, it's got a whole different um, way of, of looking at the world and a whole different purpose. So you're doing a great job there. You're just doing it with prayer, so that you're just asking the Spirit, Jesus, to come through you in a prayerful way. And if, if people say, you know, Robert, I, I can't do that. I just, I cannot do that. That's, I'm here for co-living, I paid my rent money, and listen, I'm going to go out and sunbathe today. That's, that's my, uh, my guidance. I'm going to sunbathe all day, and I'm going to go rafting in the, down the river and do a dance party when I get to Duchesne. Then you have to say, have a great day, uh, you know, because that's co-living. Uh, that's the way it was set up, you know, and when you were here on a devotional stay, it was a little different because you were kind of there to try to merge in with the community and to really be of help. And you were saying, I want to, I want to learn to join with you in prayer. So it's a little bit different context, but I think right now you shouldn't be hard on yourself at all. You offer the gifts. It's like you making a, a batch of muffins. You get those muffins out of the oven, you let that aroma come out from the muffins, and then you just leave them there on the counter. And uh, people will either take them and eat them or not. But that's not your responsibility. You know, you're not there to see, to make sure that people eat them. You know, you're just there. You have, so, you have such a sweet heart, and you have such a loving, big heart, and your, your joy is to give the joy of your heart away, not to take the, you know, to let the ego get in there with its stewarding thing and, and start to have expectations with people. That's, that's always the downer, you know. I, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were saying, you know, I really try to be intuitive, but I don't like when people tell me what to do. And I said, I, I can totally see that. I, I had the very same thing, and yet I knew that I had to be humble and start to pray and learn to discern and have guidance, because until I could get my mind clear, I knew I was going to draw forth mixed witnesses. Sometimes, you know, the gracious, loving ones that go, thank you, thank you, thank you, and then the other ones that, that go, who do you think you are? You know, as long as our mind has a has, is going through a, a, a purification process, we're bound to draw a few mixed witnesses. Like, like Helena was just saying, you know, she's got all this love in her heart and she's going to her husband Danny saying, I really am feeling, I'm supposed to fill out a devotional stay application for Spain and it's really on my heart and then, and, you know, he just, I don't trust, I don't trust your guidance. And, and yet she still had to stay with the prayer, you know, she had to to really stay with it and stay with what, what is it that the Spirit is is calling me to. And you're going through the same thing there, I think, on a daily basis. Yeah, good. <laughs> oh, um, thank you. What a sweet yeah, wait. yeah, that that that, uh, that really helps a lot. Um, I really appreciate it. So... I don't know, it, it gets into some stickiness, like when some things I feel disrupt the group and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, you know, you can't force anybody to do anything. And, you know, just come from that love and see it as gifts. And, you know, that, that helps out a lot. So, uh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that answer. Yeah, maybe we could have a, uh, like you could have like a little... Stewart, co-living stewards Facebook group or like a, 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 a little messenger co-living um, stewards group of, of a few of you with, with the steward down in Mexico and, and also the, the steward over in, um, in Spain, even though there's a bit of a time difference. Because I think these are the kind of things that are not just coming up in your mind, but they're coming up in their minds too. 
Um, this, these are the kind of things when you have interactions and people coming and going and, and there's more of a free flow than in, uh, in our community living. Uh, we have our, our expression sessions, our meetings, and, and there are people that are, are overseeing and so forth. But, but for the stewards, I think these are not unique to you. I, I actually feel like maybe that could be something that, like a little uh, steward's uh, call or a steward's expression, because there, there are others that are going through similar things, and, and when they pray and they work through these things, then you can kind of share notes a little bit, and that's, that's how it starts to free up you know, you get greater discernment when you can share notes with others that are going through similar things. I think that might be helpful. Okay, I think that's all of our hands at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Wow, what a great night. What a wonderful time here. This was our, our joy every time we come together and uh, yeah, I didn't know till till sometime this afternoon. It just kind of started to dawn in my mind about this. This movie started to come in in relation to the themes. So, yeah, I, I never can see the full extent of it though. Like, wow, <laughs> we, I haven't seen this movie for a long, a long time. But it kind of ignited all of us in this uh, journey towards holy relationships. So. And Stephen's still got that hat on. He's ready to, he's ready to go up those steps <laughs> through that door, through that blue door. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you from from my heart. Thank you for joining in. I'm with all of you all the way with this. So Helena, you know, like we'll just keep joining together, keep praying. Everybody, keep the faith. And these beautiful gatherings just help us get clearer and clearer, you know. It strengthens the prayer of our heart. And we're just here to follow Jesus and let Him really light the way for all of us. And uh, one time, Helen Shuckman was in her mind, she, she was standing next to Jesus. And she was looking at this big mountain in front of her. And she was just shaking her head. She, she's a little woman, you know. Four, four feet something, and she's just looking at this big mountain, and she's just like saying, Jesus, I don't know, I don't know if I can make it. And, and Jesus' response was, Helen, take, take my hand, and we'll go through the mountain. <laughs> mm -hmm. So she did not expect that answer. But for Jesus, you know, what is a mountain? You know, he, it's just a projection. He's like, oh, no problem at all. Just take my hand and we'll go right through it. So I think we just need to remember that for all of us, that when these things seem to be very huge in front of us, like insurmountable, all we have to do is remember to take Jesus' hand and literally feel the presence of love will, will carry us. The love and the light will carry us through anything that we perceive as an obstacle. So thank you. God bless you and thank you for joining in. We love you and we're all here. I think we can show the, the cam. There we are. The Mexico cam. <laughs> thank you. There's our mascot too. Our, uh, is it a lamb? Lamb chop. Lamb chop. There's Code Living. There's Code Living. La Casa. Robert's there with the heart in, Me in Utah Monastery. Oh, sweet. Sweet. We love you. <laughs>